is a commonly used tool where third-party institutions like banks uh, guarantee a certain payout that's payable directly to the DNR. The company would then have to pay an annual premium to maintain the letter of credit. Letter of credits have been used uh, both as short-term and long-term mechanisms across the country. Uh, one that would definitely be under consideration would be a trust fund. Uh, in this case, a permittee would fund the principal of the trust with the idea, with the idea being that the trust fund could create self-sustaining amounts of returns, essentially funding for long-term needs off the interest. We anticipate that any financial assurance proposal would include a variety of financial instruments and a variety of financial institutions. And we expect all of these on this slide to be considered as we look at calling this proposals for financial assurance. Now, Madam Chair, I committed I wouldn't spend too much time on this slide, so I won't. <laughs> But there is a handout that folks can look at, um, and it basically it outlines the typical uh, EIS process, and it also outlines the non-ferrous permit to mine rule-based process that is here as well. Just a couple things to highlight on this screen is uh, anything in green represents an opportunity for public uh, uh, information and input onto the permit. And then what I wanted to highlight is that if you look in the top box, to the left side where it says draft EIS public notice review. Um, it's, it's on the second line, the green box. That's where we are right now in Polymet's proposal. We're in the public notice period of the uh, draft, supplemental draft environmental impact statement. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to state is that the permit to mine process listed below, we haven't received any permit applications yet. So we haven't really kicked off that process. So obviously, they've done waste characterization as part of the, the uh, supplemental draft EIS. But the permit process has not begun. We have not received applications. So next steps uh, in the EIS process, we have over 10,000 comments already to review on the supplemental draft EIS. It will take time to review all these comments. Uh, we've begun the process of starting to categorize them but we won't begin uh, our review of them until after the public comment period is over. Once all the comments have been reviewed, we'll be in a better position to determine whether additional work is needed on the science of the EIS or whether there are any changes that need to be made to the project proposal. When ready, a final EIS would be published for public review, and then followed by that would be the commissioner's decision on whether the EIS is adequate. Next steps in the permit to mine process. So this is going to show the steps in the permit to mine process. And as, as I move through this, the steps on the left are the steps that are required by state law. As I move through, you'll see on the right that there's some additional actions that the DNR would take to bolster public access and pu public participation. All the green boxes you'll see will represent public opportunities to get information or provide input. So first we need to conduct a pre-application consultation and site visit with Polymet. The purpose of this step is to set the expectations on what should be included in the permit application. In conjunction with that visit, we would host a pre-application public informational meeting. The purpose of this meeting would be to outline for the public the permitting process and the input opportunities going forward. Sometime after that event, Polymet would submit its permit applications and its financial assurance proposal. And something new that we'll add here is that when we receive the first draft of Polymet's proposed financial assurance, we'll place it on our website and we'll send out, an in, we'll send out a, a notice through the gut delivery system. Uh, interested individuals could sign up today at our Lands and Minerals website to uh, receive those kind of notifications. And then uh, we'll begin our review. And Again, like I said, we'll use our own staff along with MPCA and third-party contractors. But also, during that time, we would also provide a, a means for the public to provide input on that financial assurance proposal so that we could get that input as we're reviewing the documents. When ready, we would place a draft permit to mine on public notice for a minimum of 52 days. Now, it's a weird number, I understand. But the 52 days comes from a rule requirement that requires the notice to be placed for four successive weeks in a local paper, and then an additional 30 days after that. And so the notice would be in a local paper, plus it would also be given to the EQB, through the EQB monitor, and through the state register. Uh, we would be working closely 
with the MPCA to see how to best coordinate public notice of the DNR and the PCA permits, since there are a lot of connected pieces there. And we would not place any permits on public notice until after a decision is made on the adequacy of the final EIS. Additional new steps um, that we would commit to would also be that uh, once the notice is on, uh, once the permit would be on public notice, we'll hold at least one public informational meeting on the permit to mine and financial assurance. And we would accept both objections to the permit as defined in state rule, as well as traditional comments on the permit prior to any decisions. We would then adjust the permit as necessary uh, and then make final decisions on the permit. There's a whole other process that involves hearings and appeals. Um, for the sake of time, I won't go through that today. Um, the DNR will not issue a permit to mine unless we're confident that the financial assurance is protective of Minnesota's tax. So as I mentioned earlier, we're in the public comment period of the supplemental draft environmental impact statement. All comments are due by 4.30 on March 13th. They can be emailed to the account on this slide or they can be directly mailed to Lisa Fay, who's listed here with her address. The DNR recognizes that financial assurance is one of the most important topics when considering polymets proposals. And as I said, we'll bring the highest level of professional expertise and rigor to any review. As I said, also, we would not issue a permit to mine unless it's designed to fully protect Minnesota's taxpayers and Minnesota's natural resources. So, Madam Chair, that ends my PowerPoint presentation, and uh, with your approval, I would go on to the questions. Please, Turn up the levels a little bit. <coughs> Okay, Madam Chair, I was thinking I would take the approach of not reading the whole question, but basically summarizing the question before I start. <laughs> That's what we do. Thank you. Okay. The first question that was outlined in the pre-hearing questions has to do with uh, unanticipated liabilities. And unanticipated liabilities could be something such as a spill or a leak or something like a dam breach or a pipeline failure. One example in Minnesota of unanticipated liabilities was during the cleanup of the reserve mining sites, which was completed over a many-year period into the 2000s. And some of the uh, unanticipated liabilities that came in that situation included um, discovery of a lot of waste tires and drums of grease with lead contamination. And so these were items that weren't planned for that were examples of unanticipated liabilities. As mentioned earlier, uh, the DNR has access to over 200 mine sites in the western United States. In addition to, uh, we, are, we are also reviewing financial assurance designs of non-ferrous non mines across the nation. Some of the specific mines that we're looking at for unanticipated liabilities and other issues are the Zorban Landusky mine in Montana, the Phoenix mine in Nevada, the Homestead mine in South Dakota, Iron Mountain in California, uh, and more recent examples like the Flambeau Mine in Wisconsin and the Eagle Mine in Michigan and, and many others. Each of these has their own unique financial assurance and unique environmental circumstances. And so this is just an example and that we welcome any input on other specific sites that the committee or citizens in the room or, or that are interested in this project would like to suggest. We're, we're, we'll look at them all. Unanticipated liability situations can trigger violations of the permit to mine. Any violation of the permit to mine, as I said earlier, would require immediate corrective action to correct the violations, and the cost of those activities would then have to be rolled into uh, additional financial assurance. As I said before, the company would be expected to re respond immediately to corrective actions and on their own dime, and provide additional financial assurance if necessary to protect the state. Another key is to managing the risk of unanticipated liabilities would be to have a strong regulatory presence at the site. If PolyMet is permitted, DNR inspectors will have a strong on-site presence to help catch problems before they occur and to mitigate the length of any non-compliance situation if it were to occur. And, and Madam Chair, I'll, maybe I'll just go through all the questions then if you want to come back to additional. Okay, thank you. I think that's a good idea.
Madam Chair, I uh, put up someone else's PowerPoint, so I apologize for that. The second uh, question is re regarding polymet and solvent. The second question is regarding polymet, polymet insolvency. As I mentioned earlier, the financial mechanisms used by the company have to assume the use of third-party contractors and be funded accordingly. The proposal must be acceptable to the commissioners of the DNR. The DNR would look at a combination of financial instruments, including the tools that you saw on the slide earlier. The language of any proposed financial instrument would have to withstand criteria in the rules and could not be dischargeable through bankruptcy. The department requires access to the funds and an obligation to pay cannot be affected by receivership, bankruptcy, or insolvency of the company. The DNR has contracts in place with consultants with financial assurance experience. We would also use state experts to review the proposals for the mining, engineering, as well as the financial assurance. If present, a parent company would be listed on the permit and would be responsible for all aspects of the permit to mine. Shareholders are not listed on the permit to mine. The permittee is responsible for paying all costs associated with correcting noncompliance with their permit with their own funds. So the purpose of financial assurance is to provide additional funds in the event that the, that the state could use in the event that we need to step in. But the first source of money is always going to be the company and the permittee and the parent company themselves. As I said earlier, we're looking at the structure of financial assurance for a number of other mine sites across the country. As we look at financial assurance for the long term, we would have a package, we would have to have a package that provide okay. adequate funds even if the permittee were no longer around. A trust fund, for example, may be a type of instrument that could be established early in the life of a mine and funded prior to mining in areas that could lead to the need for long-term treatment. The timing and implementation of each financial tool is a critical consideration and there would need to be adequate principal balance in a trust to ensure ongoing treatment, <coughs> maintenance, and replacement costs and infrastructure could be accomplished using just the interest off the trust and not the principal balance. There's an example in Nevada that I'll talk about later where a trust fund was established and it was backed up by another financial tool and the sole purpose of the other tool was to bolster the principal of the trust in the event that the trust underperformed. These long-term tools would also need to account for costs of additional protections. So for example, returns on a trust fund would also need to include the cost of insuring infrastructure. So not only would there be funds to follow continued monitoring, maintenance, and replacement schedules for a treatment system, but there would also need to be a fund so the state could purchase insurance, like you or I might have on our house, in the event of a natural disaster, a tornado, or a flood were to come in and affect the treatment system. So all of these are things that would be considered in the front end of a uh, financial assurance package. The next question is regarding evolving science. The initial financial assurance proposals and permit to mine conditions must be based on the current science, current cost estimates, and designed to meet the current rules. However, the reclamation plan and financial assurance would be adjusted over time to reflect developing science. The permit to mine requires submittal of an annual report. In this report, it's called the Contingency Reclamation Plan, which I discussed earlier. It has to include um, all activities that would be implemented if the permit ceased operations in the upcoming calendar year. The goal of this is to always stay at least one year ahead of any potential liabilities. At least yearly, on-the-ground results would be compared to the modeling and adjustments would be made as needed. Changes to the Reclamation Plan and financial instruments would be adjusted also as required. The department would review and approve the annual report. The rules permit the commissioner to modify a permit if new information becomes available. And we can reopen a permit at any time. So the annual review, like I said, is a minimum. We can, we can do uh, permit modifications at any time. Um, negotiations with the company are not expected, but communication with the permittee about expectations is common. And, but the department does have unilateral authority to make changes if needed. The fourth question is about financial assurance calculation and the length of liability and makes reference to time periods such as the 200 and 500 years uh, time frames that were used in modeling. As I mentioned earlier, the supplemental draft EIS 
estimates a peak financial assurance for reclamation costs of 160 to 200 million dollars with an ongoing annual need of 3.5 to 6 million dollars after the mine would cease operations. The draft EIS language was vetted through our EIS contractor with extensive experience in non-ferrous mining and were determined to be appropriate for this stage of the review. It was also vetted with the US EPA, which, which I mentioned also agreed. To determine the greater detail for cost closure, reclamation, post-closure care, maintenance and monitoring, we need the kind of details that come with the permit to mine application. We do not have an application for the permit to mine because we're still in the EIS process, and additional changes and mitigation may result from public comment if the company is to move forward. The mining and operations plan, along with multiple management, monitoring, and maintenance plans will be finalized on the project before moving forward from the EIS process. Um, just some examples, additional examples of things that would come in from the permit to mine include uh, ore production schedule, the sequence of overburden removal through mining, uh, as I said, pit cross section, slope, pit progression, tailings basin dam engineering, slope ratios, the construction materials, heights and dimensions of the tailings basin, um, as well as details such as the exact engineering of the piping systems for treatment, the sump locations, the sequence of filters in the reverse osmosis treatment system and maintenance schedules. We've had discussions with the company and they're aware that the DNR expects their financial assurance proposal to thoroughly address financial liabilities and assurance needs for long-term active treatment for as long as needed. And certainly we anticipate that the need for long-term treatment would factor into any mechanisms that were proposed for long-term financial assurance. In the mining industry, there are examples of uh, long-term financial assurance, but there's also other examples in, for other areas, such as hazardous waste landfills, solid waste landfills, public wastewater treatment, and nuclear waste management. And as I mentioned earlier, the use of a trust fund may be an option to consider when uh, we look at long-term needs where the, the long-term needs are funded off the interest of the trust, and the trust is self-sustaining. And as I mentioned before also, we've been benchmarking with other states, and we're going to continue to do that um, and to see how these challenges have been managed at other moments. Question number five is regarding a potential for revenue slash liability mismatch. Um, essentially, would Polymet be able to make enough money to cover financial assurance? And the DNR's focus would be on protecting Minnesota's taxpayers and protecting Minnesota's natural resources. Uh, we do this with our internal experts and our third party experts and reviewing the permit to mine application and the financial assurance that would be put before us. And we would assume that Polymet has done their homework on their business plan and their profitability. profitability. This is, however, one reason why the timing of implementation of financial tools is critical and protections need to be in place prior to mining ore that could result in long-term financial insurance needs. So it is an important topic, and for us it's particularly important on the timing of financial insurance tools. The next question is regarding uh, facility obsolescence, the useful life of facilities. And so the useful life of mining facilities uh, would also be used to factor in the needs for replacement costs. Polymet would provide the detailed designs and replacement and maintenance and cost schedules as part of their permit to mine application and financial assurance package. Polymet would have to include replacement costs in the long-term care numbers, spreading out those costs over time and, and factoring in the schedule into long-term estimates. Features of the facility, some features of the facility uh, at this point have been designed to minimize long-term replacement costs. So one example is the use of liners for waste rock storage. Uh, the supplemental draft EIS, I gotta set this up a little bit. So the supplemental draft EIS in includes that acid rock drainage will not be an issue for this project for two main reasons. First, 70% of the ore, or 70% of the waste rock is of low enough sulfur content that it cannot generate acid. But second, the remaining waste rock, which is called category two, three, or four waste rock, would be stored on stockpiles that are expected to be in place on a liner system for about 20 years. At this point in time, the waste rock would be disposed of underwater in a mine pit, 
or oxidation would limit the reaction for, that would create acid rock drainage. So the liner manufacturer has indicated to Polymet that they would warranty the liner system for 20 to 30 years. At that time, the liners and wastewater collection systems associated with these features could be removed and they would no longer be needed. For reverse osmosis treatment systems, pumps, membranes, and piping, um, these are, are uh, not unique to this facility, and there's quite a bit of information on their useful life. According to my colleagues at the MPCA, um, pumps and pipes tend to last 20 plus years if maintained properly, um, while the filter membranes generally have a life expectancy of five to 10 years if properly maintained. So we would be working closely with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency on all financial assurance related to a proposed reverse osmosis treatment system. Uh, the MPCA houses the state's experts in wastewater treatment performance. The key with all proposed systems and facilities is, it is to ensure they would be designed to meet water quality standards and that full replacement of the technology is funded through financial assurance regardless of when it would be needed. Question seven is regarding evolving water quality standards. Initial financial assurance proposals would be designed to meet today's water quality standards for as long as needed and calculated using today's cost values. The DNR would apply any new rules and standards as the language dictates and the company would re be required to comply if those came forward. Um, whether a facility is grandfathered in or not is, is heavily dependent on whatever the language is in a new rule or, or statute or standard that would be developed. Uh, financial assurance, though, might need to be adjusted upward or downward based on either increasing treatment needs or costs or changes to facility compliance activities if the standards were to change. Any change to financial assurance for water quality would be the same as any other permit to mine or reclamation related change. It would require a permit amendment or maybe a modification to the financial assurance mechanism, addition of another financial assurance mechanism or another financial institution, or any combination of those types of actions. The next question is about uh, proper assurance instruments for uncertain long-term liability. As I mentioned earlier, we're surveying other states and reviewing other mines to look at financial mechanisms like trust funds that have been set up to manage long-term treatment and maintenance. So one example is the Phoenix mine. And this is a mine that's in Nevada. And it has uh, a variety of different financial mechanisms in place, but ultimately it's intending to utilize a trust fund for any monitoring or long-term monitoring or treatment needs. In this situation, the concern is focused on the potential for acid rock drainage to reach high quality groundwater in the area. Polymet's long-term treatment proposal is not about acid rock drainage, but rather it's about treating treatment of wastewater to meet standards like the sulfate standard for wild rice. The Phoenix mine may have to install a groundwater pump and treat system and keep it in place for as long as needed. The impacts in this case were modeled out for centuries it would utilize a lime treatment plant to effectively neutralize any acid rock drainage. And my basic understanding is that the financial assurance package includes um, amounts for traditional reclamation, but also then a $1 million trust fund, which would generate enough interest to handle long-term treatment needs. In assessing costs, the proposal considered a variety of items like administrative costs, monitoring and maintenance, pump and piping replacement, labor and waste sludge management. This is the one though where the trust fund is then backed by a second $1 million surety bond to be used only in the event that the trust principal needs to be supplemented to generate adequate funds. The trust is held by one prominent bank but managed by another to create financial protections. And ultimately the trust has a very defined means to access the dollars. First, they could be accessed by confirmation that no impact is possible, and in that case, the permittee could get the money back in this particular situation. Second, there's documented contamination, and the company has not taken action to correct the violation. Or third, the financial instrument is about to expire. In the case of the Phoenix mine, the initial dollars are pretty low. 
And, and part of the reason is because they estimate that they have 40 years for the balance and the trust to grow before they would need it. It also has different treatment technologies than we're talking about with polymet and also different standards that would have to be. I want to restate, though, the third point in their access is that the financial instrument is about to expire. And this is very important because one of the features of financial assurance, any financial assurance mechanism that would be structured, would be to ensure that the DNR could cash a mechanism, even if it were about to expire or if the permittee failed to maintain payments on the premium. For example, our state rules require that the DNR be notified 120 days prior to cancellation of a financial assurance mechanism. We can then cash the mechanism, regardless of whether there's a pollution problem there or not. As shown in the Phoenix example, uh, redundancy or layers of tools and financial institutions um, are key to any proposal. And we are also, um, this question brought up the idea of a state-run trust. And we are very interested in continuing to explore that possibility. Uh, we've begun discussions with the State Board of Investment about a potential future role in managing a trust these discussions are really at, at preliminary stages and ongoing, and certainly no decisions have been made as we're still in the EIS process and much can change. If the project were to be ultimately permitted, the company would be required to have a robust financial assurance package that would provide adequate funding to stake it access in the event they abandon the project or, event, or pro properly, won't properly maintain the site. And as discussed in the presentation, the FDIS looks at a variety of range of funding levels as well as tools. Um, again, if there's additional mines or financial assurance packages that the committees, that the committee or interested citizens would like us to consider, we welcome those suggestions. Uh, we're early in the process of looking at financial assurance, so it's a great time for us to get people's thoughts on it. The next question is regarding the adequacy of the financial assurance laws, and I guess my simple answer is that I believe they're adequate. They're flexible. Uh, we are able to continually monitor them and adjust them at a minimum on an annual basis, but more often if we need to. So that was the shortest answer, now the next one will be the longest. <laughs> the next one is about groundwater hydrology. Essentially asking, is, ground, is good understanding of groundwater hydrology important to uh, understanding a permit and understanding the supplemental draft EIS? And the answer is yes. Understanding groundwater hydrology is necessary for estimating project impacts, issuing state permits, and implementing meaningful groundwater monitoring systems for the project. The supplemental draft EIS uh, has information on three phases of hydro hydrogeological study, including well installations, data collections, pump tests, packer tests, groundwater flows. And, and so I'm going to go through each of these three phases. The uh, first initial phase of hydrogeologic investigation, is called phase one, was conducted at the Polymet mine site. And the objective of this investigation was to determine the hydraulic properties of water quality from the Duluth complex and the superficial deposits at the site. In addition, preliminary geotechnical information was collected in the, from the superficial deposits. Geotechnical information is essentially the information that would tell us if the soils can handle facilities on top of them or waste rock stockpiles and whether they'd settle. Um, the, there was 10 shallow borings were placed in the superficial sediment and terminated in the bedrock in order to visually inspect the sediment and to perform aquifer tests. Three of the superficial aquifer borings were then converted to monitoring wells um, from which groundwater samples were collected. Aquifer testing was conducted on 10 of the exploration borings in, in the Duluth complex. In addition, water samples for laboratory analysis were collected from two six-inch diameter exploration boreholes in a water well supply, uh, supply well on site. The objective of the phase one study was to provide information regarding the ability of the Duluth complex and superficial deposit, uh, deposits at the mine site to transmit water to, into the North Met pit. The quality, it also, the other objective was to check the quality of water within the Duluth complex rocks and the superficial deposits and also to do the preliminary geotechnical uh, characterization of the superficial deposits. All this information is needed for permitting. Uh, it's used in the water appropriations permit, the NPDES permit, and the permit to mine. The second hydrogeologic investigation, or phase two, was also conducted 
And the objective of this investigation was to determine the hydraulic properties and the water quality of the Virginia Formation. Uh, four six-inch diameter pumping wells and five two-inch diameter observation wells were steer installed near the contact point between the Virginia Formation and the Duluth Complex. So essentially the geology out there is that you have the surficial geology, the glacial till that is laid down. Beneath that is the Duluth Complex, which is the ore body that polymath would be mining. And that comes on top of the Virginia Formation. And so these hydro, hydro, hydrogeologic investigations were designed to um, look at those interactions between those different uh, layers of the geology. Um, a pumping test was conducted at each uh, pumping well. And, excuse me, four six-inch diameter pumping wells and five two-inch diameter observation wells were installed at this contact point. I don't know if I said that already. A pumping test was conducted at each pumping well. Three 36-hour tests and one 96-hour test were run. And uh, during and following these tests, water levels in the pumping well and observation wells were recorded. The data was analyzed to determine the hydraulic properties of the Virginia Formation. Following at least 12 hours of pumping, groundwater samples were collected from each of the pumping wells and each of the test wells. Groundwater samples were analyzed for total metals, dissolved metals, and general chemistry parameters. And this is the data that's needed to help predict uh, water quality in the mine pits during operation and during closure. A third hydrogeologic investigation, phase three, was conducted at Polymet as well. And the objectives of this were to evaluate the effects of mine dewatering on wetlands in the area in the vicinity of the, of the mine and to gather additional water capacity data for wells uh, in the Virginia formation as well as water quality data and groundwater within the surficial deposits, the Virginia Formation, and the Duluth Complex. Three main activities in this phase were the pumping, the pump tests to evaluate the connectivity of the bedrock and the surficial deposits, uh, capacity tests to evaluate the potential vertical movement of water in the Virginia Formation, groundwater sampling to further characterize water quality in the surficial deposits as well as in the Virginia Formation and in the Duluth complex. Essentially, the purpose of this phase was to understand water volume and water movement in the ore deposit as well as the rock formations above and below that deposit when they're connected. Some additional monitoring wells were installed in 2011 and 2012 to collect additional groundwater quality data. And uh, some of the field activities included uh, rotosonic borings through surficial geology. Uh, at a total of 26 locations to characterize the surficial deposit. And monitoring wells were then installed in 21 of those borings, and groundwater samples were collected monthly uh, through August 2012. Okay, question 11 is regarding public input. I outlined in the PowerPoint uh, opportunities for public input and uh, so what I'll do is summarize, like I said, early in the permit to mine process, we'll have a public informational meeting to outline what the public participation would look like. In that situation, we would invite uh, not only the public, but participation of the <coughs> Pollution Control Agency, the Environmental Quality Board, and local government. Assuming polymet applies for a permit to mine, when the application is complete, we put it on public notice, publish it in the state register, EQB monitor, each, and then in the local paper for four successive weeks. That was my 52-day uh, public notice period. And then, uh, again, written objections to the proposed operation and permit may be filed no later, day, no later than 30 days following the last date of publication in the newspaper. As I stated earlier, we added new public input steps, including posting of the first draft of the financial assurance proposals on our website and notification to citizens via our Gov delivery system, we would provide a means for people to provide input on that first draft, and we would coordinate our public notice with the MPCA's permits. We would not intend to start the public notice process for the permits until after a decision is made on adequacy of the final EIS. We're also uh, committing today to hold at least one public informational, informational meeting during the public notice period, even though it's not required by state rules. And we would also accept both formal objections to the permit, as well as traditional comments for consideration prior to any final decisions. Question 12 is regarding engineering standards. 
the DNR and the MPCA would evaluate engineering design, facility, and equipment plans in determining whether standards can be met with the design that's proposed. The focus here is on performance to meet the standards. For the example of uh, reverse osmosis treatment, we'd be coordinating that engineering review heavily with the MPCA. Uh, as I said, reverse osmosis treatment is widely used in many applications to treat wastewater or even drinking water. And along with the MPCA, we have ensure that any proposed system design is both durable and protective of water quality. We do not, however, dictate the control technology, the technology that a company proposes. We do dictate that it must be effective in protecting natural resources and it must meet water quality standards. Ultimately, we require that facilities be operated in compliance and have the authority, as I said, to modify, suspend, cancel, or revoke a permit or to assess civil penalties in order to correct violations for non-compliance. Question 13 is regarding annual financial assurance review. Uh, the DNR would review and evaluate Polymet's financial assurance at least annually. Like I said before, we can open that up anytime. Uh, the initial financial assurance, re assurance requirements would need to include the assumption that long-term active treatment, wastewater treatment facilities would be in place. Passive non-mechanical treatment systems would be required to be evaluated during the life of a project, of the project, by pilot step, by pilot studies and tests under actual site conditions. The financial assurance would then be required for passive systems if they are approved. But going forward with the first round of analysis on financial assurance would be about assuming that they would have long-term active treatment in place, and we would not assume that they would have passive systems come into play when we do that initial calculation. If proven successful, uh, passive treatment systems could potentially lower the costs and the corresponding financial assurance, but we would only evaluate that after the technology was proven. Uh, the next question is about project impact modeling, and this is regarding, um, um, again, 200 and 500 years of treatment. And I'm going to ask uh, Assistant Director of Ecological and Water Resources, Steve Colvin, to come up and work through with that question. Stephen Colvin, S-T-E-V-E-N-C-O-L-B-I-N, and I'm Assistant Director for the Division of Ecological and Water Resources for Minnesota DNR. As Jess said, he asked me to respond to this question because it has a bit more to do with the EIS than the financial assurance. Um, what but one component of the question asks, what are the ranges and how long reclamation efforts will have to go uh, at a 90% modeling significance? And uh, I want to um, state that the model was developed to ensure that the proposed treatment approach would meet water quality standards for all parameters at all evaluation points for as long as uh, it would take and for the peak concentrations that are predicted. Therefore, the model was designed uh, assuming proposed active treatment for as long as required to meet the evaluation criteria. And it was not designed to answer the question of how long might treatment be needed. That was an assumption in the model. So some of the physical processes and treatment measures that potentially reduced duration of the active treatment, therefore, were not fully explored or included in the model. For example, the Wilson model currently assumes that all constituents in waste rock, such as sulfate or metals, would be released at the same rate over time until completely depleted from every rock in the stockpile. Uh, this is not something that happened in nature, thus the model tends to overestimate the actual amount of constituent release. And there are other parameters uh, where, we, I, where we design things like that as well, because we're answer, seeking an answer to a different question. The second question is, is just asking about the possibility that the ranges extend longer than 200 to 500 years. It's a possibility. Uh, however, as I just indicated, 
The model was not designed to predict the length of treatment, so any estimate I could make. And then the third question is, is what steps have, has our agency taken to verify model's ability to accurately anticipate non ferrous mining impacts? Are we carefully evaluated and approved all of the assumptions, the data values or data ranges, the types of analyses that were used in the model, the equations, the calculations, the formulas, in some cases, like baseline groundwater quality at the mine site, we required additional data collection and analysis. The model was calibrated, evaluated to determine if it produced realistic results. Uh, QA, QC, or quality assurance, quality control, was done on the model by both the proposer and by uh, DNR's contractors. And finally, a DNR and PCA staff uh, carefully analyzed and evaluated model outputs. Uh, another thing that we did at the request of PCA on some parameters, particularly some of the baseline water quality parameters, was to conduct a sensitivity analysis to see how um, sensitive the model outputs might be to uh, some of those input variables. Okay, Madam Chair. Uh, back to question, back to me. Question number 15 is uh, financial insurance civil penalties. And the DNR has not had to assess civil penalties for the failure to comply with financial assurance requirements. We do have authority to impose civil penalties if a permittee violates any provision of state statute rules or the permit. Uh, other actions available to the DNR if the permittee fails to comply with corrective actions requirements include suspension of a permit to mine, assessment of civil penalties, revocation of a permit, or modification of a permit. The biggest penalty a company could receive is revocation of the permit, followed closely by cashing of a financial assurance mechanism. And we have the authority to use all of these options if uh, the situation presents itself. The final question is about the proposed evaluation. I've talked earlier about the process that the DNR uh, would use to go through this evaluation. As I said, we have staff with expertise in material handling, construction, and mining costs. We have engineers, geochemists, reclamation specialists, to name a few. We've hired consulting firms through an RFP process uh, with mining expertise and financial assurance experience. And we're also looking to bring in additional uh, financial expertise to help review any proposed polymath financial assurance proposal when it's submitted with their permit to mine application. Our current contractors are Emmons, Oliver, Emmons and Oliver Resources, or EOR, uh, DPRA Incorporated, and Environmental Resources Management, or ERM. EOR special, specializes in the technical review of management plans, data packages, and the science of a permit to mine. DPRA has both mining and financial expertise and would be focusing on financial reviews, financial instruments, and the ground truthing of any of Polymet's cost estimates. ERM is a company with over 5,000 uh, employees, which has extensive experience in uh, mining operations, engineering, reclamation, long-term water treatment and monitoring, as well as risk assessment and financial assurance for mining. And as stated earlier, um, uh, one of the questions in the, in the question was whether the public would have access to uh, comments from our consultants. And all correspondence that's submit, submitted by our consultants is um, part of the public record and is available. So as I stated earlier, we are currently in the public comment period for the supplemental draft EIS. No decisions have been made on the adequacy of the EIS, and public comment can directly result in changes to the proposed project. Polymet has not submitted its permit to mine applications, nor its detailed financial assurance proposals, and therefore no decisions have been made on financial assurance for this project, and we encourage Minnesotans to weigh in now with their ideas. The supplemental draft environmental impact statement will be on public notice for can take comments and is open until March 13th, and all comments must be submitted to the DNR in writing by that time. Madam Chair, that concludes my comments. And uh, we'll stand for questions. Thank you. Uh, we will, uh, as this committee, I will submit on behalf of the committee the questions that House Research uh, always uh, as part into the public record. Um, I also would note that staff has provided 
the contact information and their handouts up there if folks want to put something into the public record. Uh, Representative Hanson. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Director Richards. Uh, a couple questions on the different topics. And so you were uh, discussing the financial assurance, and I was listening to see about uh, financial assurance for wetland mitigation. Um, you were talking about the financial assurance for the DNR, and, and we have statute uh, providing for financial assurance for local governments. And I think some of the mines have provided financial assurance for wetland mitigation. So just maybe a little bit about that local government impact and how that plays into the uh, document. Madam Chair, members, uh, absolutely wetland mitigation would be, would, be, would be part of any financial assurance proposal that we would require that part of the financial assurance proposal. Uh, again, the key with uh, wetland mitigation is the timing of that financial assurance mechanism to ensure that any mechanism to fund the uh, mitigation activities would be in place prior to the impact. And so um, wetland mitigation is also uh, uh, something that can be uh, changed or improved also through the life of a permit to mine as we do the annual review. So one of the things we look at in that annual review is the progression of mitigation and it is the, um, whether there's additional mitigation that's required and is the mitigation plan lining up with the actual mine operations as they were proposed. And so not only would we change the permit if needed to uh, address mitigation, but we would also then at that time change the financial insurance package. Uh, does the authority and the responsibility rest with DNR for the insurance assurance with wetland mitigation, or does the local government, does there have to be uh, financial assurance for the wetland mitigation for local governments as well for their Madam Chair, members, the, uh, the authority for, for financial assurance determination is through the DNR. But just like we do with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, uh, we would coordinate that with both of them. And so, uh, as we do with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, they uh, they will have very strong interest in the reverse osmosis treatment system and financial assurance that would be in place for that. And there, there are instances where um, you can devise a financial assurance mechanism that's payable to an additional party as well. Madam Chair, to follow up on a different subject, you mentioned a state trust fund. And, uh, you know, we've had some experience with state trust funds, uh, the tobacco settlement and other trust funds where money seems to get reappropriated. So when we look federally, we have uh, something like the Strategic Petroleum Reserve where the federal government keeps oil, uh, essentially, uh, as an asset for me. Um, and I know we have severance taxes and we have occupation taxes, but is there a model out there that where the state would keep part of the ore, that we would have a, a tangible asset, we would have copper, Minnesotans um, would have copper, nickel, maybe platinum, et cetera, and keep that as a tangible asset for financial assurance uh, rather than money that is at trust time that can be appropriate. Um, and this, is there any example of that or is there any possibility of that being really involved? Madam Chair, members, uh, that's a very interesting concept and I, I have not found uh, thus far an example of that, but it's something we will definitely look into. Um, the uh, the the ability for a trust fund, let me step back, if we were to go down a path of using um, a strategic metal preserve or something to that effect, um, I would suggest anyhow that it would be in addition to financial insurance, or it would be something that would go along with financial insurance and not necessarily the only financial insurance. So it might be a part, again, if that were a, a, an option, it would be part of a, a broader package that would include multiple tools and multiple mechanisms. Um, the concept of a trust fund uh, being, you know, raid proof is very important. And this is something that uh, before we would execute a trust fund, 
uh, we'd have to lawyer it up a little bit. And as I've talked about uh, um, in the case of the Phoenix mine, um, you can see in that situation, it's actually held with two different large financial institutions and not the state. Um, and in that situation, the, the ability to draw from that trust fund has, ex has very descriptive and uh, limited reasons. And so I think those are all very important topics that we would have to definitely have in place for the Elvis. Elvis. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, Thank you, Director. I appreciate the input into this, and I know it's a fairly complex issue to kind of wrap your head around. Hey, I'm curious as to what value the department placed on water, and uh, I just understand that there are some concerns about impacts to watersheds, and uh, I just want to know what dollar value, I mean, and maybe that's a real simple way of putting it, but just so we can understand, you know, what was the dollar value placed on arbitrarily a gallon of water, and then how would that be put into the financial assurance package? Madam Chair, members, the purpose of the financial assurance, like I said in the slides, is to um, estimate um, the costs based on today's costs, based on today's rules, um, and the uh, so potential value, future value of water is certainly an important topic, and what and what the permit to mine would do, and then ultimately the financial insurance package, would, it would be designed to be protective of water quality. And so the first thing that would occur is that we wouldn't issue a permit to mine um, or agree to a financial insurance package unless we were confident that it was protective of all natural resources, but you know, specifically of water quality, which then inherently protects the value of water. Um, but in addition to that, then, that financial assurance package would need to be robust enough to um, ensure that those treatment technologies which are designed to protect water quality are in place and um, you know, can survive um, long term even if the company's not around. Uh, and then lastly, I guess I would say that uh, as science or as we talked about, as science and or standards change, process, the, the permitting process, the annual review process allows for change. And so if uh, this committee or this uh, body were to put forward uh, a dollar amount that needed to be included in financial assurance for the future value of water, um, we would adjust accordingly. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I'm curious, I, I don't think I, I heard much of an answer. I, oh. Is there... <laughs> I mean, seriously, it, I mean, this should be a, a relatively simple calculation. I mean, we should be able to understand how many gallons of water flow through the watershed. And we should be able to assign, even with current values, is it a penny a gallon, a tenth of a penny, a hundred thousand of a penny a gallon? This should be a pretty simple calculation. So what is the value that the department, under current circumstances, places on water, and just how many gallons of water? I mean, this information should be available, should it not? Madam Chair, members, the draft EIS contains um, extensive evaluation of water quality, uh, including the gallons of water that would be uh, flowing through uh, a wastewater treatment system or through uh, mine pits um, and through the process. I don't have that information for you. I apologize off the top of my head. It is contained in the draft EIS. Um, the, as I mentioned, the financial assurance calculations that are in the draft EIS are numbers that were submitted by Polymet. They were uh, then cross-checked with our consultants who have experience in uh, financial assurance, and then they were run by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And so I, I don't know right now if there's an actual dollar cost per gallon of water, as you're asking. But um, we vetted the uh, languages in the supplemental draft EIS for those parties and they thought it was sufficient for this time in the state of review. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I guess this is just kind of troubling because, I mean, and I'm not just talking about the water that runs through the treatment facility, because, you know, if, if you have a situation where you get some leaching into a watershed and 
you know, it affects a person's drinking water, well, that person then has to go out and procure other sources of water. And so it'd be my hope that money is set aside within that financial assurance package to make sure that a person who has no benefit to this facility but has a potential negative impact is not unduly burdened. And once again, I mean, I'm just asking because the, this is something that the DNR should have readily accessible. I mean, what the value of a gallon of water is, and not just, you know, for the proposer, but for the other entities, individuals, you know, people, local units of government within the watershed. And I'm hopeful that, I really hope that you have some modeling that indicates how much water is going through the entire watershed. I mean, we've been appropriating money for a long time to go and, and at least understand our hydrology. And I, I really hope that it, this shouldn't be hard for you to have the department bring back just a simple how many gallons of water moving through the watershed and what is the value. And I would say that, you know, looking at it statically today, you know, that's one thing, but we all know that water is becoming more scarce. And so I'd like to understand or know what value the department is going to place on water as it becomes less and less available and, and we have more demand for it. There's the whole uh, price and flexibility demand calculation and, and I'd like to just understand uh, what value, because we should be talking about, you know, not just present value, but future value of water. So could you please bring that back? Yeah, I, I've been concerned, Madam Chairman, I've been concerned about these financial instruments ever since we first started talking about it. I'd much rather see something that's, in my mind, I can understand, like maybe a bond issued by a bonding company like Lloyd's of London to see if they could get into this discussion and and assure us that what's that what's happening. But the um, the uh, uh, you know what the when you look at the SDEIS, there are uh, um, the, there are three pages of financial information uh, information in that. And one of the things that's kind of disturbing when you go back and look at it is that the source of those three pages is from the uh, um, fourth company from that, that it looks as if it was taken directly from the memo that ca that came from the fourth from the fourth company. Now the fourth company is a company that is specifically working on the behalf of Polymet. So one of the things when you look at the basic rules about EISs, it's not that you just put something in. You're also required to show the work. So did you, was there, has there any requirement made to the fourth company or to, uh, to show the work behind this financial assurance document? Madam Chair. Members, uh, the I don't know about the specifics of what Quat submitted, but I'm, I'm sure if it's uh, in, in our well, I guess shop, I'm it, talking it's about available. So, but uh, oh. the specific pages are pages 136 to 139 in the SDU. Yes, Madam Chair, uh, members, I understand the the um, company in any case submits proposals for permits, for supplemental draft EIS, for their project. The company submits those proposals, and our job is to review them with rigor. Um, the, at both the state and federal level, financial assurance is not required to be in the EIS. Um, however, we've had conversations with EPA about this, and we believe it's important that to start at the supplemental draft EIS stage, and to at least outline, as the supplemental draft EIS did, the range of dollar estimates and the range of tools that might be envisioned through the life of a month. Now, as we've talked with EPA, and we agree, if there are additional details, so if Polymet submits a detailed financial assurance proposal, and we begin to subject it to the state rigor of review, if we have additional details that we could place in the final EIS, then the final EIS would have additional information on financial issues. Well, the major question is the requirement to show the work that gets to this 
financial assurance. Is there an intention of doing that? And, and I guess I'm that the final, so will the final EIS then look into the work that's behind those financial institutions? So there was one discussion at some point that, well, we'll put off the final uh, uh, financial guarantees until the permit of mi to mine is issued. And I think some of us think that that's very much too late because the kind of public input that we had at the time of the permit to mine is very much different than the public input that we had at the time of the EIS. And I'm not sure, what I'm not quite sure is what happens to public input compared to the preliminary EIS and then the final EIS. So. Okay, Madam Chair, members, I think I'm, I think I, I'm where I, I understand now where you were asking me. I apologize. Um, the, the financial assurance in the draft EIS um, is open for public comment right now, as we've talked about. And at some point, Polymet will submit a detailed financial assurance package. Now, as I said, if that detailed package and analysis is available, at the time of the final EIS, then it would be included in the final EIS and open again for public comment. But in addition to that, that's just an EIS process. Like I said, once we receive um, Polymet's first draft, regardless of quality, we will place it on our website and make sure people have access and we'll provide a way for people to provide input right away into the financial assurance. And so the permit to mine process is the process, is the place where financial assurance is handled and the detailed analysis of financial assurance occurs. But we recognize that the importance of this issue and the importance for public input into this important issue for the state. And that's why we want to make it available early, take public input often, and, that, and that's why we'll also um, provide additional public input opportunities in the permit to mine process if we get that. Well, what? I guess one of the problems has been looking at a previous application and looking at the um, MINTAC extension project and looking at the permit to mine amendment application there. And again, the financial assurances there are very, very small in the permit to mine. And I think what some of us are looking for is we're looking for the kind of financial assurances that show that not only DNR, and I, you know, I don't know why, I think I trust your hydrology experts more than your financial experts. It's just kind of what the job description of the agency is. But um, I would really like to see the big shots in the financial community, you know, looking into this and having the ability to look at the financial assurance, particularly over this long period of time. And we've seen these examples in other ones where the mining company, just a small mining company that no one ever, you know, that this is their own, goes bankrupt. And I'm not sure how the assurance that you've made that bankruptcy doesn't discharge the responsibility, I'm not sure how, how actually it doesn't, and, you know, how you then go after it. And the financial company backing it is also, you know, what I would like to see is something that has a much more robust financial community, but I think the major thing I've gone to is that there is this basic statement for EISs that you just don't put a statement in it, you also have to show the work behind it. And I don't think we've seen that in this preliminary one, and the question is, will we see it in the final one? And it's not acceptable to me to say that it will come in in the permit tomorrow. Because the experiences with that and the absence really of public comment on that seems to show that that's much too late for the process to go on. So I'm, you know, I'm going to leave to more experts than me, you know, on on the science issues that we're looking at, geology issues, the reclamation issues, and so forth. And I'm not even pretending to be the expert on the financial issue. All I'm asking is that the financial backing issues be answered by experts and then we and I really look into independent verification instead of just going to the polymet consultant for that information. 
pretty good with the next question, but first I would like to uh, acknowledge that uh, Representative Falk's question is a good one, and it's one that has to uh, be answered. Minnesota's been blessed with an abundance of water, and we love it. But because we have an abundance of water, we never put a monetary value on it. But look what's happening in California, mm -hmm. uh, where water has become so scarce, and as water becomes scarce, our neighbors have scarce water, the value of their water goes up, the value of our water will go up, and it'll probably go up dramatically. So as I'm listening to your contingency plans, I haven't heard any um, set aside of money for what happens if something happens to this resource that is going to become more valuable over time. So that's something that needs to be addressed. Uh, but let me get to question 10. Um, when you answered that, you did not say anything about the recent media reports um, that suggested that the modeling um, may be flawed. Do you want to talk about that? Madam Chair, I'd be glad to turn that over to Steve Cole. <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, Representatives, um, the uh, at some point during the uh, polymet uh, uh, EIS development, a uh, gauge, a new gauge in the station was installed in the upper part of the near the polymet mine site. Uh, that was not built for the polymet project. It's not related to the polymet project. Uh, DNR has, over a period of time, collected some water samples from that. And uh, in a one-year period of record, uh, developed a rating curve and so really at this point we have another gauge site with one year's worth of data. What we intend to do and what we're actually doing now uh, with our hydrology staff and with the assistance of uh, some other uh, hydrology and hydrogeology experts is we're trying to evaluate what, what does the gauge information from that site mean because it's there are quite a few complications that are related to North Shore Pit, just north. Measured surface water flow, unmeasured surface water flow, and unmeasured groundwater flow, uh, in addition to uh, base flow for the, the parking. That our hydrologists are trying to sort out, and we're trying to determine, uh, first of all, which uh, set of data might be better to use uh, going into the, in the final EIS, whether or not modeling, uh, or, or, or redoing the model in, uh, uh, for that particular variable is uh, needed. And we'll also be looking at other areas where we have, uh, where we know we have additional data and we anticipate at least the possibility that uh, commenters might, have, might also other, uh, other uh, data that we might need to evaluate uh, in terms of uh, modifying parameter bot values and new running them. The basic problem here that we don't have a geologic atlas for this area of the state. <coughs> because we don't have a geologic atlas, we know very little about the hydrology. So one of the concerns I'm sitting here with is that you are placing monitoring levels without knowing the hydrology. And normally you know the hydrology first. So you put the monitoring wells in where they will be the most helpful. And we are, uh, I think you're in a pickle here because we don't have a geologic atlas. Because the DNR uh, thought about pushing for a geologic atlas in this area before we go ahead with uh, all of these mining plants. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, members, uh, I have uh, a few answers to that. I, I uh, did an email exchange with Mr. Dale Sutterholm from uh, Minnesota Geological Survey yesterday. Uh, first of all, um, the uh, 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 Minnesota Geological Survey is assessing 
uh, using a couple pilot sites, one's in Babbitt, one's in, I believe, Virginia, uh, to assess essentially uh, whether or not a um, uh, county geologic atlas um, would be feasible for uh, St. Louis County. Uh, a couple of problems uh, that he cited in his email to me are uh, low road density, low well density. Uh, geologic atlas tends to use a lot of existing information rather than new information. And of course, that's the part A atlas uh, that they do, so that's the geology part. Uh, part B would be hydrology. Um, and so we're probably looking in the ballpark of five years uh, away from uh, having a, a county geologic atlas. Uh, a second thing that he mentioned in the very last sentence of uh, his uh, email is it's important to realize that the atlases are not a substitute for the kind of detailed work necessary to characterize the geology at proposed mines. The atlases are helpful in providing a framework for those studies. But in fact, the uh, um, hydrogeologic work, sampling work, and analysis, analytical work that's been done specifically for polymath might have been aided by a geologic atlas had it existed, but uh, uh, is adequate without uh, the geologic atlas. I think the, um, the third thing, and this is an environmental review answer, you know that um, one of the one of the areas of, of uh, in an EIS is how to deal with incomplete or unavailable information and the environmental review rules kind of instruct that um, uh, if information uh, isn't available or can't be made available in a reasonable period of time or it's beyond the state of the art, uh, there, um, uh, you essentially note that in the EIS and you note the reasons why um, you can't provide that information and uh, you proceed without it. So that, that would be a, a third reason. I think what would have been uh, most terrific had we had it would have been a, a, a gauge with a 10-year uh, period of record uh, at the proposed project site. What we had was a gauge with a 10-year uh, period of record pretty close to the project, well, 17 miles from the project site, but in the same watershed. And that's, for my hydrogeologist, that's not too bad. That's better than they usually get. Usually they have to engage from a separate watershed. Well, having a not too bad says to me that financial assurance has to be much stronger than if we have had an atlas and knew the flow of water. Uh, so now that we don't, we just kind of got some information but not enough, it almost seems like um, you have to assume the worst. And that is one of the problems in dealing uh, with financial assurance here. Uh, if you don't know what's going on underground, you don't know how the water's flowing, then what do we assume for dollars to take care of a problem that we can't define? That is, I think that's the fundamental issue here. What are the dollars for a problem that we haven't yet defined? Uh, Representative Gamble. If I could ask just one question to you. And I'm kind of remember here, but didn't we appropriate a significant amount of money to the agency to update and, and create geologic atlases? Representative Falk, we are trying to get our, uh, finish all the atlases over the next 10 years, and we have been appropriating money for that. Madam Chair, I guess the question is, is I think that we've known about this proposed project for a number of years, as the agency has. Um, perhaps it'd be prudent to ask the agency if, if they fast-tracked an atlas for St. Louis County or what the progress is, or just where they're focusing their efforts, because clearly we have a, a lack of, of knowledge here, and perhaps focusing efforts in this part of the state would be more prudent than and other parts not that they aren't important, but we've known about this for a long time, so I want to know why has more progress been made. Madam Chair, uh, Representative, uh, as I had said earlier, the uh, Minnesota Geological Survey, which starts the Atlas process, uh, has initiated a geological Atlas study Right now, they're in the uh, step stage of trying to um, 
determine feasibility for all of St. Louis County. Once they're completed with the geology work, that's a necessary precursor, and that's about a three-year process. And then, uh, once Part A is complete, then DNR can uh, continue and will continue with the hydrology piece of it, and that's about a two-year task. So it's in the queue. Right, it's not even in the queue. It's it's under it's under uh, development. It's just in early stages. I, I think appropriately it should be said that there are pilots under review, not a geologic atlas for the whole thing. Uh, Madam Chair, you're correct. There are pilots to determine feasibility. Thank you. And I guess just the um, so when was this process started? Was it started a year ago, two years ago? How far back was it initiated? Madam Chair, Representative, I don't have when it was started, but I know that uh, from the recent conversation, the pilots have just been selected. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just made kind of an article in there, but this project, I mean, we, we've known about it for, I'd say, upwards of five, six, seven years, and so just knowing that this is going to be somewhat in-depth process, I would have hoped that that work would have been started at a more timely time to actually have some relevancy to our discussions here. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Director, my uh, questions are, um, the first part of my questions are directed towards the uh, 6132 rules. Can you please just uh, walk me through those as far as when those rules were um, implemented? Uh, what was the process to develop those rules, and did we take uh, public input? And then subsequently, uh, does the DNR and the EPA support the rules that we have in place today? And then I have follow-ups after that. Madam Chair, members, uh, I believe the, the non-ferrous uh, permit to mine rules, which included financial assurance, were uh, created in 1993. And uh, with any rulemaking process, there's a robust uh, opportunity for public input um, and engagement in the rulemaking process. And so that was all. There's a full record uh, statement of need and reasonableness, uh, all public comments related to the rules, and we have all that available. Um, Part of your question, I'm sorry. Um, are the rules adequate? Do the, uh, does the DNR and the EPA do they support the rules as they exist today? Uh, Madam Chair, members, the DNR uh, believes that the rules are robust and they're protective of Minnesota's natural resources. Um, I have not asked the EPA uh, to believe they're adequate, but uh, that may have been done at the time of the rulemaking. I was over the PC at that time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, You've said this uh, a couple of times, but once again, will a permit be granted if the financial assurance plan is not approved by the DNR? Madam Chair, members, no. And Madam Chair, um, I guess the last question, usually at what point in the permitting process is the financial assurance information expected by the DNR? Meaning, is PolyMet, are they ahead of schedule with the information requested, are they behind? Uh, is it sufficient as far as uh, the process itself. Madam Chair, members, uh, right now I would say that PolyMed is right on schedule with their proposals for financial assurance. The draft EIS contains uh, the level of financial assurance that is appropriate for a supplemental draft EIS stage, uh, and the detailed financial assurance package comes in with the detailed engineering that comes with the permit to mine application. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, Mr. Colvin. Jefferson, will you speak in the morning? Mr. Colvin, thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Colvin, you really rattled through number 14. Um, could you give us one more time what you said? And I'm particularly interested in the concept of the model. I'm envisioning a pile of waste out there. And that what I thought I heard you say was that the model anticipated that rain and thick air and things that would affect a pile of waste rock in the model would completely take out all of the uh, 
sulfides out of a rock, I mean, let's say a big rock. Even from the very center of the rock and deposit it on downstream and into a river. But it seems to me like it would more affect the outside perimeter of the rock, not the inside. So I'm trying to get my arms around that. And I thought I heard you say something like that, and if I was wrong, I was wrong. So could you give it to me again? I, I don't think it, my, my point is, I don't think that it's going to get into the center of a pretty hard rock. Madam Chair, Representatives, uh, I think, uh, although I ran through it, I think the, the representative got it pretty close. My, my point in, in uh, providing that example is that when, when we were trying to model the, uh, the uh, uh, water chemistry, because we just presumed a long time of treatment, we didn't have to put an awful lot of effort into trying to figure out precisely how much of, of whatever chemical parameter might reach out of, of the different rocks, rocks of different sizes and different locations in the stockpile over the course of time. And so to make the mod, to simplify that aspect of the model, because that wasn't an important question, we just said, we'll, we'll just assume it all went to that. So, so it, it's a simplified thing. Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, so actually, the model then might be overestimated the amount of the uh, going out into the environment. Would that be the correct assumption? I think I heard that. Madam Chair, uh, Representatives, uh, that's certainly what I would uh, conclude for this particular aspect. Madam Chair, uh, to uh, Representative Hansen's question about financial services and royalties. Uh, there is an instance and a precedent uh, where a mining company pledged as collateral to the state their mining, uh, their, their, uh, their ore reserves as collateral for a project. But I believe the problem with this project would be that the, the third party owns the mineral rights, not polymer. And so that particular thing, even though there is a precedent with Minnesota Steel and Iron, and I believe the Bennett family owned the right, uh, at least the very, at the very beginning, it was the Bennett family owned the right. They could do that because they own them. But under this circumstance, the third party owns them, and we'd have to get them to agree to pledge the mineral rights as part of a financial assurance package. I'm not saying that's not po possible, but I am saying that it's different. But there is a precedent for pledging mineral rights as a part of financial assurance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Director Richards, uh, my question has to do with the timing of financial assurance detailed information. Uh, it's, it's my understanding that we don't really understand what process the company is even going to use until we get to the permitting process. Is that correct? Madam Chair, members, yes. So the supplemental draft outlines options, and it outlines uh, estimates over the period of the life of the mine, but does not outline what process or combinations of mechanisms or how each one would be linked to specific reclamation needs that would come through with permit to mine. So, thank you, Madam Chair. So to accurately put together a financial research package is really virtually impossible until you've identified the mining processes that are going to be used, and they would not be defined until the permitting process is that correct. Madam Chair, members, that's correct. We need the details of the permit to mine and the engineering in order to properly go through the entire financial insurance proposal. Okay, thank you. So would you say that the timing and how Minnesota's process is set up with financial assurance and when the details are incorporated, is it appropriate or should it be changed? Madam Chair, members, I believe that it is appropriate. We need to uh, have the permit application details in order to properly assess financial assurance. To, in order to compare um, reclamation estimates across the nation, we need to know exactly what the details of the permit to mine will bring forward. Um, and that process would start um, following, as I mentioned, a public informational meeting to kick off the permit to mine process sometime thereafter when one would submit their financial report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Director Richards, 
Can you walk us through a little bit? I mean, we're at the supplemental draft EIS at this point. Um, that's not the first uh, document that's been created throughout this process. Uh, two uh, volumes of uh, public input, it has changed from what? So take me from the first document, that, uh, the first EIS that was done, uh, to where we are today and, and the, the scope uh, of, of those two different uh, documents, please. Madam Chair, uh, I'll defer that question to Steve Colvin and he's, he lived through two of the changes. Madam Chair, Representatives, um, the uh, uh, EIS process started with uh, uh, the submittal of what's a, a, a called a scoping uh, EAW data submittal by PolyMet uh, to the DNR. Uh, then we, um, from that, we create a companion document called a draft scope and decision document. And together, those documents uh, uh, are intended to develop the blueprint for the EIS. Uh, there's a, a public review process with a public meeting. Uh, comments are received, and the uh, uh, the scoping decision document is finalized, and then starts the uh, development of the EIS. And uh, a part of the blueprint that, that's outlined in in the uh, scoping uh, process is uh, the different alternatives that are going to be examined, the different sorts of uh, scientific investigations that are going to be done, and so. There, there's literally hundreds of um, uh, different scientific reports for different aspects uh, of the polymet process. Um, the information from those reports is reviewed in depth and detail uh, by our, uh, uh, by the co-lead agency experts in those respective areas and by the cooperating agency experts in those co in, in uh, the areas of their expertise. That's uh, part of the federal process. Uh, keep in mind that Polymet's a joint state federal EIS, so we incorporated the federal process in it. Uh, uh, our contractor eventually takes that information once it's finalized and produced the draft EIS document. Uh, that's the document that went out for public review in uh, late 2009, early 2010, and was, um, again, we had public meetings a long public comment period. Um, after that, and, and based on a number of different things that I won't get into right now, um, a decision was made by the co lead agencies to uh, do a supplemental draft EIS. And so from uh, 2010 until late 2013, we worked with, we reworked a lot of the analyses, actually brought in a, an entirely different water model and uh, develop supplemental draft documents. So that's kind of a snapshot of where we got, came from 2005 to where we are now in early 2014. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just to follow up on that, obviously DNR and other agencies uh, have a lot of time and money tied up in this whole process. Um, what is the mechanism that DNR has in place to help them to recover their costs that are involved in developing the EIS and the SDI. Uh, Madam Chair, Representatives, uh, the state uh, requires the proposer to pay uh, the costs of, uh, of the EIS. Thank you, Madam Chair. And to this date, uh, do you have any kind of an estimate as to uh, how much uh, that the proposer has paid uh, in developing the EIS? Madam Chair, uh, Representatives, I don't have it off the top of my head. The payment to the state is in the ballpark of 20 to 25 million, I believe. I will look that up and provide that information so that I can give an accurate up to date. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, then moving on, Director Richards, you talk a lot about the reverse osmosis process, and you talk about rigor of review, uh, you talk about rigorous evaluation. Um, walk me through exactly what is reverse osmosis. I think I have an idea. And then also describe for me the quality of the water that is the result of the reverse osmosis. Madam Chair, members, um, 
depending on how, what level of detail you want to go, I might have to call the PCA up. But reverse osmosis is, uh, as I mentioned, it's a uh, very widely used treatment technology. In fact, I even have one in my house for drinking water. And it's a filter membrane system. And uh, essentially, the water comes through that uh, uh, filter membrane system. And uh, it is a scalable technology. So therefore, depending on the volumes of the water, you can add additional uh, filter units to a reverse osmosis system. Uh, it is something that is uh, readily, easily monitored to see performance. So my understanding from my colleagues at the PCA is that you will, you are through monitoring, you can tell how the membrane system is performing and whether you need to replace membrane systems. And so it's widely used in um, not only uh, wastewater treatment um, across the state, but also in drinking water filtration. And uh, the purpose then is to ensure that it meets state water quality standards. Um, one example in this case is that Polymet is proposing to meet the state's uh, sulfate standard for wild rice, which is 10 parts per million. Thank you, Madam Chair. Final question. And this is more of an observation. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that, uh, you know, I read the Duluth uh, Tribune in their editorial today about uh, the hearing and so forth. And, and I hope I've seen other companies walk away from significant investments at Big Stone too, and places like that. And I certainly hope that that doesn't, that, that this legislative session doesn't turn into, as the Duluth Tribune refers to, as some sort of an assassination. Thank you. I guess I'm not clear what that last comment was, or, or, but I was just going to acknowledge uh, Representative Dill with the, thank you, Representative Rukavina gone, I was hoping that you would have the, uh, uh, not the historical knowledge, but the precedent ability to give us some background on that. Um, on the groundwater question, and I was following up on Representative Falk and Rukavina's, and I think it comes into cost. Um, and we're talking to finan about financial assurance with cost and groundwater. I went back and checked the statute about the from the Groundwater Act of 1989 about the degradation prevention board, um, which talks about degradation from human activities. And when we're talking about cost, whether it's reverse osmosis or those things, it's it's cleanup or mitigation or in back when I worked in environmental protection, I always said prevention was better than impact. So how does the environmental impact statement deal with 103H, the um, groundwater degradation statute? Um, I mean, where are there places where that's put in, where the statute applies to the practices um, to minimize the, the degradation? How does that because we've got 25-year-old law here relating to degradation, but we've been talking about cost. Madam Chair, Representatives, the um, environmental impact statement uh, talks both about uh, measure, mitigative measures uh, that are taken that uh, to try and prevent or reduce degradation. Reduce is probably a better word. Reduce degradation of uh, ground and surface waters, as well as uh, treatment uh, methodologies, uh, as, as more as uh, corrective actions. If you, uh, just as an example, uh, the, um, the permanent stockpile is designed in a manner that uh, it has a, it will have a, a permanent uh, geosynthetic cover, and that's intended to reduce water flow through the stockpile and to reduce groundwater contamination in that manner because it would reduce the amount of groundwater getting there, uh, having more of it run off uh, off-site uh, before it uh, um, encounters the, the rocks. So there are there are various uh, measures like that in the rocks. So well, if I hear it, the intention is to reduce groundwater contamination, is that? Uh, Madam Chair, Representatives, the, for that particular element, yes. Just so the committee understands that groundwater in Minnesota under, under our rules has been considered water. Okay, uh, let's see, we have uh, representatives.
Representative Clark, and we're going to try now to be real quick with our questions because I would like to get to our distant test other testifiers. Please, Mr. Richards is going to be back with us. So I think uh, I'm not going to take any more questions here after the ones I have on my list. Uh, but he will be back, and we are not limiting the hearing. We will be back and answer all questions. Uh, but Richard Clark is next. I'll be, I'll be real sure that um, I was also wondering about the first of the 14 um, financial assurances based on models and said numerous times during this discussion that the models are not designed to predict time why why were they allowed not to have the time Madam Chair representatives uh, what we felt was the most Thank important you. question because we were presuming that uh, it would require treatment over a long period of time we thought it would be much more important for the model to examine uh, all uh, all concentration uh, uh, possible concentrations coming out of the uh, tailings basin or off the stockpile and including peak um, concentrations so that was the direction we went with the design of the model I guess it's, I don't know how you can get to even defining peak if you're not looking at a time frame. So I'll see that that maybe we'll hear from others who can help understand this. Uh, I have a question about the, the wetlands. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly, it's kind of a kind of relation to um, the folks line of questioning about valuation of things. And, um, my understanding is that the wetlands that may be displaced by the project are um, not only unique to that, what wetlands within a watershed serve as some, some purpose within the watershed. And uh, if they are lost, it's not necessarily easy, especially these um, wetlands replace them quickly or to, and I, I'm not sure how, you, how one values that and um, and also the fact that uh, will the wetlands that are you know replaced to put in to replace the ones that are lost will they will they um, benefit that watershed or will they be placed somewhere else and I think I think in some ways we're dealing with a very unique water system here that's different from you know perhaps putting in replacement water uh, um, wetland in another part of the state. I'm just wondering how you value, evaluate that and the kind of value of uh, those weapons. Madam Chair, members, uh, one of the things that comes in with the permit to mine application is also uh, the approvals for wetland mitigation if necessary under the wetland conservation. And so uh, the DNR is the uh, authority over uh, wetlands related to mining. And so part of that process is to figure out um, and it's also discussed in the EIS, but part of that process is to figure out, um, you know, what type of uh, replacement and um, um, recreation of wetlands on site would have to occur, but then also what kind of wetlands uh, off-site mitigation would have to occur, what the ratio would be. And so things like uh, the location of proposed mitigation sites along with the ratio of the amount of wetlands that would be needed are important factors in determining the cost of those wetlands. The value of land is important. I don't have those estimates off the top of my head, but um, um, certainly um, that was that is absolutely something that we have to have on the front end, and then we have to look at annually because, as you know, land prices change and uh, wetland value will change too, and so that's something that would have to be uh, definitely uh, monitored throughout the life of the month. Representative Benson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And Madam Chair. Um, this question that I'm going to ask the uh, testifiers is something that, uh, you know, my neighbors and friends, uh, relatives have been asking because um, lots of people aren't into all the minutia, you know, the mining uh, industry and all that, but uh, they asked me uh, about a news article in which I think it was in Tribune suggesting it, it may take uh, as maybe as long as 500 years to uh, do uh, monitoring and uh, maintenance. The first question is, 
Are those kinds of uh, news reports uh, accurate? Are they uh, within the ballpark? Are they where where all where is that in, in relation to reality of mining operations in sulfite mining? Madam Chair, Representatives, uh, as I had, uh, commented earlier, the um, the exact time period uh, or an estimate of the time period over which uh, treatment would ha have to be done was not part of what we studied in the DRS. We, um, we rather studied how uh, we presumed it would take a long time and studied uh, a long enough period of time to make sure that we encountered the peak concentrations for the different types of uh, parameters that, that we were modeling for. And so uh, to look at where uh, that peak hit at, say, the mine site, it took up to 200 years, depending on where on the Park Ridge River we were looking, and at the plant site, it took up to 500 years, depending on where on the uh, Inveris River uh, we were looking. And just you know, share a quick you know, follow-up. All right, then, uh, could you give me an illustration or an example somewhere in the United States or even in the world in which uh, sulfite uh, mining operation has been monitored or maintained for up to 100 years, or 25 years, or 50 years? Do they exist? Madam Chair, members, that's what some of the research we're doing right now. So there are examples of uh, Iron Mountain, for example, and I'm not in, in great detail versed in it, but Iron Mountain, for example, is a situation where it was mined um, many years ago and uh, prior to having any sort of financial assurance in place. EPA has stepped in and has somewhere in the range of $900 million now in assurances, and they expect it to be ongoing for a long time and, and estimates in thousands of years, I believe. And so, that's, there are examples, uh, there, there are many examples out there of different situations that involve mining of copper, nickel, and sulfide-based ores. Um, some of them have had success and some of them have not. And we want to look at all of them. And so um, absolutely that's part of the research we would be doing in trying to determine the financial assurance package. Well, Madam Chair, just a you know, comment, maybe because I'm an old school teacher, history teacher, but. I can't think of any human activity that has been monitored and maintained over such a long period of time. Uh, I don't think they're even doing that well with the uh, pyramids in Egypt, really. So I'm just really uh, curious as to how, you know, how one can rationally see uh, ongoing uh, maintenance of a project like this. I, I just don't know of any in history. Uh, so that's why I'm asking the question, and I think that's really an essential one because we do have a fiduciary responsibility to future generations. It isn't just uh, for us and for our individual uh, gain. We have responsibility for uh, posterity. It was Teddy Roosevelt said, so "We're not building this nation for a day; we're building it for generations to come." Thank you, Madam Chair. And I think one of the, the big issues is that the you know the good old days they weren't that good. And uh, to summarize, how is this project going to differ from the bad actors of the past? Madam Chair, uh, members, it all has to do with the application and the design features of uh, the project. And I'm not going to be here to advocate for the project or against the project. But the supplemental draft EIS describes design features that are based off of experience with um, history and experience with past mining operations. And it is uh, uh, important then that as we look forward or if a permit to mine application comes in, that we look at it with that critical eye, that we look at it with that knowledge of history and what is worked and what hasn't been. Thank you. Uh, we will now.
So I'd like to begin with um, the fact that uh, Grand Portage and Bottle Axe attended a financial workshop in 2007 that was presented by the US EPA headquarters Hard Rock Mining Team. And we thought that it was so valuable. Um, at that time, we had already begun to participate in uh, evaluating the Polymath Project as cooperating agencies that Final hosted um, a financial assurance workshop for the Minnesota GNR, MPCA, US Forest Service staff, ERM and Parliament staff uh, to begin thinking about this very critical issue. Uh, and uh, part of the impetus for that was that the state of Minnesota has spent millions of dollars remediating mine sites. And the example that I've given is reserve mining, but also um, the old LTD site where Parliament is trying to set up its operations uh, left the state without a considerable amount of money. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, financial assurance is the cost estimation process to assess the funds that are required to perform the tasks of mine cleanup. And these cost estimations aren't based on how much it would cost the company, for example, Polymet to clean up the site. They should be based on how much it would cost a government agency to hire a contractor to do the cleanup work. And because um, during bankruptcy, equipment and uh, virtually everything that can be is, is removed, it frequently costs the government um, to hire an outside contractor twice as much as it would a corporation. And so um, considerations for cost estimations, I have them listed. Um, what I'm really here to talk about today is um, long-term operations and maintenance. Uh, but also, I'd like to say up front that um, earthwork, demolition, water management and treatment, things that happen sequentially as a mine is closing, also cost a lot of money. And it's dependent upon the number of acres of land that are disturbed in part. So uh, both the type of wastewater treatment that's needed to maintain compliance with water quality standards and the number of years that that treatment is needed um, are things that must be included in financial assurance. And when acid mine drainage is likely to occur, um, financial assurance needs to be increased tenfold. And even stormwater attenuation often requires long-term treatment. Um, so that's a consideration that, that isn't often thought about. And also multiple mitigation strategies so that cost estimation would be based on um, different types of pollution prevention to um, avoid groundwater pollution. Um, it requires active wastewater treatment, liners, caps, pumping systems, barriers, um, and particularly in the case of polymet, there's been um, a desire to move to passive treatment systems, um, and that's because they're orders of magnitude less expensive than active systems. So the first ever uh, letter of credit required by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and the Minnesota DNR was for Masabi Network. Um, it was a $15 million in total 
letter or letters of credit for the mercury filter and mine area cleanup. Unfortunately, that wasn't enough to adequately study the problems, and it wasn't nearly enough um, for the company to be able to comply with Minnesota water quality standards. And something that we probably have all considered is that companies receive profits from mining, the public at large gets the minerals, we clearly need them, but the Minnesota public and tribes bear a huge environmental and financial risk associated with those projects. And that's why we feel that companies should be required to share meaningfully in long-term financial risk that their projects create. Um, perpetual mechanical treatment will likely be required for all non-ferrous operations in, that uh, come to be in the state of Minnesota. And so financial assurance for perpetual treatment needs to be part of every project proposal. And as um, Jess Richards just said, perpetual treatment uh, requires that the principal balance of financial assurance be enough to cover the costs uh, of maintenance and operation using only the interest accrued. And this is in addition to financial assurance that would be set aside for closure and reclamation. Or, in other words, those earth moving, uh, revegetating types of activities. And so I'm going to give some quick examples. Um, and this is to sort of put into perspective um, what our concerns are. And um, so the Zortman Land Dusky Mine, that's been. Uh, mentioned previously as one of the lines that the uh, Minnesota DNR has looked into in terms of financial assurance. Um, and for each of these uh, case examples that I've listed, I list the acres of disturbed land, and that's because that is part of the equation of how much financial assurance would be required. Um, another part of that equation is how much water is flowing through a site and how much water would need to be treated. So at Zorban Landowski, there was an EIS in the environmental impact statement. They predicted that there would be no generation of acid because of the low sulfur content of the oil. That sulfur content was 0.2%. The range for pollen net, as listed in the supplemental draft EIS, is from less than 0.1 to 0.6% sulfur. Very quickly, not in hundreds of years, um, in slightly more than a decade, data showed widespread acid generation at certain land dusky. Shortly after that, lawsuits were filed by EPA, the Mon Montana DEQ, Fort Belknap Indian Community, and non-governmental organizations. Um, the result of those lawsuits was a 1996 consent decree to build additional wastewater treatment systems for $32 million. In 1998, the reclamation bond that had started uh, around $10 million was increased, and it had been increased over time, but it increased to $70 million, and Pegasus Gold filed for bankruptcy. The uh, reclamation and closure plan that was originally approved would have cost $54 million more than the reclamation The agency preferred reclamation alternative cost $28 million more than the available financial assurance. Um, as of today, there's money set aside for perpetual treatment for that site uh, until 2017, at which time additional funding will have to be set aside by the state to continue uh, to treat <laughs> water from that site. Summitville, uh, another site, uh, uh, a modern mine, started up in 1984 with the purchase of 1,200 acres to develop a large-scale open pit mine uh, that disturbed 550 acres. The mining operations ended in 1991. Uh, with leaching to extract the last of the metals until March of 1992, six months later or so, 
the lactic resources filed for bankruptcy. Um, after the bankruptcy the proceedings were completed, the site was declared a super fund site, and the public ended up putting the bill for $150,000. Idaho Cobalt Project, another project um, uh, that hasn't gotten off the ground, but um, has been permitted, uh, is located in Idaho. It's proposed to be an underground mine where ore would be mined from two separate ore bodies, disturbing only 132 acres. These facilities uh, would include a lined dry stack tailing area and waste rock disposal facility water management pond, water treatment facilities, and various other facilities. Idaho Cobalt for this project was required to set aside actually a bit more than 44 million in financial <coughs> assurance. The reason that this is not really comparable to Polymet is because, of course, Idaho Cobalt only planned to disturb 132 acres from Polymet's SDEIS. There will be 1,700 acres of disturbed land. Um, the average mining processing rate for Idaho Cobalt, 800 tons per day versus Polymet, 32,000 tons per day. Um, Idaho Cobalt, an underground mine, Polymet open pit, Idaho Cobalt, dry stack tailings, Polymet online wet tailings. Um, and these are all things that create additional risks. The dry stack tailings uh, going on a liner, and waste rock going on a liner prevents leaching of pollutants into the water. Um, and so they're really two very different projects, and it's um, understandable then that um, that very low number of 44 million would be required for financial assurance. Another comparison is the Flambeau mine in Wisconsin. You often see that compared to Polymet, and it's really not a good comparison. And that's because the uh, percent copper for the Flambeau mine was about 10%. Polymet is about 0.3%. Uh, the Flambeau mine was only 220 feet deep and 32 acres in size. Polymet's mine pits are you know, between 6 and 700 feet deep. 912 acres, so Polymet is proposing a mine 90 times the volume of the Flambeau mine. Uh, mine life, also very different. Flambeau mine, four years versus Polymet, 20 years. Flambeau mine, 8 million tons of waste rock versus Polymet, 308 million tons of waste rock. And also a Flambeau mine, which would be quite different than Polymet, is that there, were, there was no processing of ore at the site. So there were no tailings. The oil was shipped directly off site. Polymet will be processing on the site. Um, so now I'm going to get into examples of copper mining. And um, ASARCO uh, is still uh, operating copper mines, mothers and refineries in the United States. But in 2009, they declared bankruptcy. And the parent companies were also Asarco and Grupo Mexico. As part of that um, bankruptcy settlement and reorganization, Asarco provided $1.7 billion to federal and state agencies for environmental cleanup and restoration. And those, that was for uh, eight sites, I believe. So, um, back to the more modern mines, um, the Phelps Dodge, Dodge Corporation has a couple of mines in New Mexico, the Chino and Tyrone mines, um, and they're located in a historic mining district in New Mexico, much like Polymet would be in northeastern Minnesota. They're both large-scale open pit mines. <coughs> Uh, they started up in the 70s, they're expecting to close around 2020. Um, and their surface, their combined surface disturbance is very similar to Polymet. The Chino mine is expected to, to disturb 9,200 acres, Tyrone 6,000 acres. And the financial assurance set aside for surface reclamation and closure 
is 228 million for Chino and 278 for Tyrone. Both mines have provisions in place to, um, for perpetual water treatment to prevent the formation of pit lakes and to protect, uh, in, and that's in order to protect groundwater and wildlife that might use the pit lakes. Um, and so all of these examples, except for the Flambeau mine, occurred in relatively dry environments. And as uh, Jess Richards pointed out earlier, um, many of the examples we have for mining, um, where there's financial assurance, are in much drier climates than Minnesota. Much less water, um, and still, to prevent contamination, keeping pit lakes from forming and um, using dry stack tailings methods are used and that's to prevent long-term pollution and the need for clean of its sites. And so a fundamental difference between polymet and these other mines is that it would be located in a wet environment with interconnected surface and groundwater and that creates a lot more risk than many if not all of these other projects. So now I'm going to go back to Masabi Nugget because Bar Engineering for Masabi Nugget developed uh, cost estimates for treatment and um, for specific types of treatment. And since we're talking about today long-term or perpetual treatment, this was important. Um, so if you can recall in the Polymet Supplemental Draft EIS, Polymet suggests that long-term treatment would cost approximately $3.5 to $6 million per year. So they're going to be operating um, a reverse osmosis nanofiltration wastewater treatment system. They also have pumps, liners, um, they have a seepage capture system for the tailings basin, quite a bit more wastewater treatment on site than is estimated here. These are only estimates for very specific types of wastewater treatment. And although the alternative to uh, for in situ biological treatment was the only one that was estimated out for 20 years. Um, I still uh, went through the math, put it out there for you, it's simple math, um, to show that if you double the operation and maintenance of these treatment systems, especially the nanofiltration reverse osmosis system, then Polymet's estimates, the high end of their estimate, at $6 million per year, is 60% of our engineering's estimate for Masabi Nugget, or 6%. So again, what I've done is a very fast of the envelope calculation using bar engineering's estimates of treatment costs for Masabi Nugget. And, and the purpose, again, I say of using this is that um, bar engineering is a certified engineering firm that does a lot of work for numerous mining companies, including Polymer. Um, and so, back of the envelope calculation, and that's truly all it is, using um, fixed interest, no inflation, absolutely nothing else. Um, the fin financial set-aside that you would have to have to be able to pay for operation and maintenance of these specific types of systems range uh, for nanofiltration between $168 million and $336 million. So, 
now I, I move forward with this to, um, even though based on uh, Barr's estimates for reverse osmosis nanofiltration operation and maintenance for Masabi Nugget on the same property that Polymet would be located on um, as being far more expensive. Um, I used Polymet's estimates from the SDEIS, and again, using fixed interest, no inflation, back of the envelope calculation, um, and the financial set-aside uh, range at the high end from 200 million to 400. And so then um, I looked at a more sophisticated or a complex model of financial assurance using an average in interest rate of 7%, average inflation rate of 2%, and with a higher interest rate, the amount of financial assurance required is higher because it includes inflation. And again, using an even more sophisticated model, what we see again is that the financial assurance doesn't go up. If it goes up, it doesn't go down. So the back of the envelope calculation is strictly a range finding. And that's the message that I'd like to bring to you today, that, that this is a very critical issue. I don't disagree with the Minnesota DNR that it would be very difficult at this time to set in stone the amount of financial assurance that would be required to ensure that wastewater treatment was available for 500 years. Um, but <coughs> what I do want to demonstrate from this is that this is a huge financial liability for the taxpayers of the state. And that I'm really thankful to have this opportunity to speak to you today and that you are considering this, this very important. Thank you for your testimony. Are there questions from the Thank you for your testimony. I'm, I'm, um, I'm also looking to, to you to maybe um, expand a little bit on some of the future water quality. Um, I think that was your, you know, um, some of the questions that have been asked about contamination, where it goes, what we know about it. And I'm wondering if you've looked at that um, and found any, any different findings than um, what we've gotten from, from calling it you know, the uh, compliance to the Pepitch River. Uh, especially since you're up there on the uh, water waters. Could you talk a little bit about that? And if so, I guess the other question is some of the concerns I've raised to heard people about our tribal communities with the impact on our uh, waterways. So I'm not going to speak to those two issues. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about the water quality modeling, and not only do we have differences of opinion about flows in the Partridge River and flows in the Embarrass River and um, something called storage or storage coefficients used in the Embarrass River side, when in 2006, when Grand Portage, Fond du Lac, and Joyce Fort were allowed to participate uh, in a review of Polymet. We recommended that flow data be collected and that additional groundwater monitoring wells be installed in the bedrock particularly, but also in the superficial aquifer. We believe that this is a very data poor project. And in fact, as part of the uh, Cliffs consent decree to clean up the uh, ex 
existing LTV tailing space and uh, water discharges on areas that five discharges. Um, our engineering measured flows in the streams, uh, the tributaries to the embarrassed river. That data was never used in the modeling. The modeling for flows was estimated. And the flows in the embarrassed river were estimated from gauging data that was from 1942 to 1964. In 1942, there were no mining features in the embarrassed river watershed. And we can demonstrate that by aerial photos. So many of those tributary streams didn't exist. So trying to, to um, model flows and add a bit of additional flow for the tailings basin, because that was water that was taken out of the Partridge River watershed when tailings were put into the LTV tailings basin, um, <coughs> isn't scientific. <laughs> and um, the storage coefficients that were used to model the um, surficial aquifer and the bedrock aquifer at the Challenge Basin site um, cannot be found in a range of any scientifically peer reviewed literature. We find that. Um, be flawed science. And in the Partridge River, um, we determined using the flow data from the old gauging data, which is somewhat newer than that what was used in the Embarrassed River, um, that there was additional base flow that uh, and, and it's something that we brought up continuously because that, that's the amount of water that would need to be treated. Um, it affects how much when the, the pit begins to refill a polymet. That affects how much water would have to be treated to mix with the polluted water flowing into the pit. And, and that's part of the mitigation strategy. So we have big questions about whether those mitigation strategies would actually work. And it goes to the heart of financial assurance because if there's more water flowing in, there's more water that needs to be treated. So I, I hope that I sort of answered that in a, in a general way. Thank you. So the issue of the UDF peer review and, and all the inequality of the science is one thing, and then I guess just the other thing is, are you concerned that, that these flows will, will take the um, contamination up to the boundary waters of the BWCA via the Dutch River or any other? No, but I am concerned that that will flow into the St. Louis River and into Lake Superior, the largest freshwater resource in the United States. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like for the, uh, Ms. Watkins to clarify her statement that she's not clear, that she's not concerned about the water waters and the drainage from this uh, of the discharges going uh, to the boundary waters. Exactly where do they go? Do the, do the uh, my question would be: Do the discharges from this go into the boundary waters? Madam Chair, committee, uh, no, they do. They do not flow into the boundary waters. They flow into the Partridge and Embarrass River subwatersheds, which flow into the St. Louis River, which flows into Lake Superior. No, I just thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to make it clear to those and anyone listening that this project really has no effect on the boundary waters whatsoever. And there's a lot of information that suggests that it might by people who aren't in the know. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I appreciate you making it. Thank you very much. Okay, next we have Betsy Bell, friends of the Boundary Waters. From now on, each of the testifiers will have five minutes. And we will uh, let them know um, how time is going. Uh, as we, I 
don't intend to cut anybody off in mid sentence, but it does give a clue to wrap up. Madam Chairwoman, uh, members of the committee, my name is Betsy Dobb, and I am the policy director with Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness, a nonprofit conservation organization. The Polymet Project raises such significant concerns about the financial risks, in part because of the anticipated long duration of contaminated drainage that will require treatment. And the project's analysis shows a mine that will produce polluted drainage at the mine site and require water treatment at the mine site for a minimum of 200 years and at the plant site for at least 500 years. And these numbers come from Polymet's own water analysis. In your packets, you have, I believe, two graphs that look like this. And I'd like to take a few minutes just to briefly explain those two graphs, walk you through what those are saying and showing. These graphs show water quality expectations for two types of water contamination. On one of the graphs, you see the abbreviation CU, that stands for copper. And on the other one, the abbreviation SO4, which stands for sulfate. These are just two of several contaminants that Polymet analyzed in a document called Water Modeling Data Package Volume 1 Mine Site. These graphs show concentrations of these two contaminants in water that has been collected at the mine site and is being sent into the wastewater treatment facility for treatment. This is water that has seeped or drained from mine features like the mine pits or the waste rock piles. You can also see in the title of the graph, WWTF, which means wastewater treatment facility, and the word influent, which means the water that is being sent into the facility for treatment. This is not measuring or representing the effectiveness of the treatment plant but assessing the level of water contamination before it is treated. And then at the bottom, you see a red dashed line at the bottom of the graph. And this is the legal water quality standard, the target that needs to be met. There are three other lines on this graph, and they show three different probability scenarios that were modeled. The P90 level is kind of a worst case probability scenario for the concentration of contaminants. And the P10, the bottom line, is a best case probability scenario, with the P50 level as kind of a mid-range probability. And as you can see, at year 200, the levels of both copper on the one graph and sulfate on the other graph are not anywhere close to meeting the water quality standard dash line at the bottom of the graph. So this is water that's going to need to be treated, or else it will be a source of significant pollution. Copper, for example, at levels above water, the legal water quality standard is extremely toxic to fish and other aquatic life. So we know the proposed polymet mine will require at least 200 years of active water treatment at the mine site. And there are similar data for the plant site showing water continuing to need treatment at 500 years. These graphs are not depicting travel times for uncaptured pollution. This is influence into the plant. Polymet did analyze pollution travel times for uncaptured water, but this is not what is being shown here. And these graphs are also not depicting concentrations of contaminants in the water just sitting in the mine pit lakes. This is seepage and drainage that the mine's collection systems have captured and are sending <coughs> off to treatment. 200 and 500 years of active water treatment are likely to be very expensive. <coughs> And yet the Polymet SDEIS does not describe at all how much this would cost, how it will be paid for, or how Minnesotans will be protected from financial liability. We have heard the DNR say that financial assurance will be worked out in the permitting process. But it is hard to evaluate long-term environmental impacts if we don't know what financial resources will be in hand or how secure those funds will be. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency urged Polymet four years ago to include financial assurance in the environmental impact statement. But exactly four years later, we have a second EIS that omits this crucial information. While it may be DNR's custom to calculate financial assurance at permitting, there is no legal reason preventing the DNR from doing it in the EIS, and there is every cautionary reason to do so. 
we believe it is vital that the EIS includes financial assurance disclosures. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions? I don't see any. Thank you. Uh, Paul McAbee, uh, Advocacy Director and Council of Water Works. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Now, if I put pages on this, can people see them in the audience? No. All right. I'm Paula McAbee, and I am the Advocacy Director and Counsel for Water Legacy. The Water Legacy is a small grassroots nonprofit formed to protect Minnesota's water resources and the communities that rely on them. And you have in your packet the first page, which quotes from Minnesota Rule 6132-1200, and that financial assurance can cover funds both for reclamation and for corrective action. If you read the Polymet SDEIS, it talks about contingency mitigation measures that are feasible options that could take place um, if compliance with water quality standards is not attained. But the EIS says the contingency mitigation measures would not be initially included in the financial assurance package. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that question one either it's unanticipated liability, uncertain liability, or contingent liability, is what happens not to the water that is gathered up and put through the reverse osmosis plant process, but what about the other seepage? And first, I have a picture here of, in your packet of the Anaconda Mine Superfund site. There was a study done that even the projects that predicted in their environmental impact statement that they would comply with water quality standards, 89% of the sulfide mine projects actually ended up violating water quality standards. And that's not usually because a treatment plant wasn't funded for long enough, but because pollution seeped into the groundwater, welled up into the surface water, or transported further in contaminated groundwater. And the EPA calculated, this was all reported in the Federal Register in 2009, that the largest source of Superfund liability in the United States is from hard rock mining of copper and nickel. And that, at the time, they estimated that total as 2.6 billion. And the EPA said that even if there were no other copper nickel mines that run into trouble, the total estimate, taxpayer liability to clean up those mines was someplace between 20 and 54 billion dollars. But I really want to show you, I think the most important documents here, these are maps, um, maps that are taken out of the Polymet Supplemental Draft EIS. And what this blue illustration, this first one is the Polymet Mine Site. And it looks kind of like a peanut, and you can see the Category 1 waste rock pile, you can see the different pits, and all this blue drainage. This is what the Polymet EIS admits is seepage to groundwater. Now, advocates from our group, uh, volunteer expert scientists, tribal scientists, we might disagree on the volume of the uncaptured seepage, the level of contamination of the uncaptured seepage, and even the direction of the flow. But it is an undisputed fact that everybody agrees to, whether it's Parliament, the advocates, the tribes, the EPA, is that there will be uncaptured seepage. There will be uncaptured seepage at the mine site, and there will be uncaptured seepage at the tailings waste site. This little, uh, looks like a little handprint, is the site of the tailings. And you can't tell from this little map, but the tailing site is approximately 2,900 acres, or four and a half square miles. And so when you talk about seepage from tailings that are being dumped in a facility that size, there's some significance. As you can see, it is acknowledged that there will be seepage. Our only question is how much, how polluted, and how soon. Now this map that's also in your packet of faulted bedrock is not contained in the EIS though we believe it should be. A volunteer geologist came forward after the balloon hearing and he said, you meant, some people mentioned the question of fractures. Did you know that there were at least 14 faults immediately under the mine site? I said, I had no idea, because the EIS denies that there are fractures. And that's important, because if there are fractures underneath the mine pits and underneath the waste rock piles, then whatever pumps you have, the pollution can go into those fractures and be transported. And this right here, these black lines are fractures that the Minnesota 
uh, Geological Society has verified. This is not, um, our, our geologist is really just sort of an expert who went and read the maps. So at the mine site, there's a huge potential for dispersal of pollutants to be involved in bedrock. At the tailing site, um, one of the issues our volunteer geologists and volunteer hydrogeologists have both looked at is the Polymet EIS claims that this huge, huge tailing site, basically thousands of gallons per minute of water, that the total collection from a row of pumps on one end will be 99.38% of the seepage. And what we say is even Mary Poppins was practically perfect in every way, would not attain that value of collection. So what we're asking is that in addition to looking at the costs of reverse osmosis, that there should be detailed analysis of contingent risk and the need for corrective action right away in the initial financial assurance. We're also saying that it's important that the agencies look at including joint ventures and parent companies on the permits so that when they come out in year 10 with the elevated number for financial assurance, the company doesn't just go bankrupt and leave the bag. And finally, we would suggest that the legislative committees could have a role in supervising the progress on financial assurance and the progress in permitting to make sure that there's actually protection being provided to the taxpayer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions from members? I don't see any. Thank you. Uh, next, we have a cap offer. Staff attorney, if you so send us your Okay, I'm sorry. We're going to have a lot of comments. setting aside an amount of money at the beginning of operations. It's sufficient to meet all of the projected reclamation costs at closure, as well as the ongoing water treatment needs. Polymet's own estimates, that own estimates anticipate hundreds of millions of dollars of in environmental cleanup obligation. The Minnesota Department of Natural Resources uh, uh, rarely requires financial assurance for taconite mines, uh, and this would be one of the largest financial assurance packages ever before uh, the state of Minnesota. There is a, an unfortunate history uh, in the pattern, uh, there is an unfortunate pattern in the history of mining in the U.S. Ore is discovered, uh, mined, depleted over time, and frequently uh, what's left behind is a bankrupt company and an environmental disaster. Uh, LTD is an example of this pattern at the very site that climate now controls. LTD declared bankruptcy and left behind environmental damage with an estimated cleanup cost of over $25 million. A pay-as-you-build plan uh, will not work. Uh, consider, if you will, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, a U.S. government agency uh, that now supports the retiree incomes of about 40 million Americans. These plans were sponsored by companies that failed, plans that the government now has to support. Parliament did not, uh, despite over 2,200 pages of documents, explicitly quantify the amount needed for financial assurance. We think that's an important number to consider. Um, is it the size of a red box or a barn? Um, so we uh, estimated this number based on the ranges of numbers that they provided. Their numbers may be conservative, uh, but they state that the cost of rec reclamation and closure could be uh, as high as $200 million. Ongoing water treatment costs lasting 200 years or more would be another $6 million annually. 
there are many assumptions about inflation rates, labor rates, equipment costs, uh, rates of return on investments, discount rates that go into these factors. Generally, all of these are very difficult to forecast for three to five years, let alone 200. That said, an amount of $200 million, if invested at 3%, would produce a $6 million cash flow annually. So an estimate of Polymex's total need to meet its financial, financial assurance obligation uh, in 20 years would be $400 million. $200 million for closure and $200 million for unbroached water treatment. They've not provided for this amount in their capital plan. Um, in the thousands of pages of documents, there's no discussion about this amount or how they intend to fund it, uh, how they intend to fund their financial assurance obligation. Minnesota provides for five different uh, financial instruments to meet the financial assurance requirement. But in our view, not all of those are uh, viable options. Um, we have talked with uh, uh, experts in environmental engineering firms who are familiar with commercial insurance uh, in these matters, and they're saying given the amounts that we're talking about here and the time frames involved, commercial insurance and surety bonds aren't an option. Uh, although a standby letter of credit is mentioned, letters of credit have fees. If you're paying banks the fees, you're offsetting the beneficial compounding of the earnings of, uh, uh, that uh, could be obtained if these funds were in trust. Uh, to us, the viable option is really only one. Uh, that's a trust fund um, where the Minnesota DNR would be the beneficiary uh, and uh, uh, earnings would be reinvested uh, and increased over time to meet future obligations. Madam Chair, uh, members of the thank you for your attention. Thank you. I don't see any questions. Madam Chair, <coughs> members of the committee, uh, first I want to thank you for holding this hearing. NCA, the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy, which I am here representing, believes that this is an area that is ripe for legislative oversight, and we appreciate your willingness to inquire into this issue. I'm a staff attorney with NCA. I also hold a master's in public policy and environmental policy from the Humphrey Institute. Among my other qualifications, I'm one of the uh, few unfortunate souls in the room who has actually read the 2200-page SBEIS. So my first point is that financial assurance should be part of the EIS process. This is so for a few reasons. First, the purpose of an EIS is to evaluate the environmental impacts of a project. This seems self-evident. The Polymet SBIS concludes that this project has minimal impact on the environment. After 2,200 pages, that's what they conclude. It concludes this because it relies on a series of man-made structures to try to capture polluted water before it leaves the site. And, and let's be clear about this. There's no disagreement between Polymet, the DNR, and organizations like ours that have some concerns about this project about whether this site will produce polluted water. It will, we agree likely for hundreds of years. Polymet proposes to capture all or almost all of the water before it leaves the site. The EIS assumes that this effort is completely successful and therefore there is little impact. And here's where we disagree. NCEA does not think it reasonable to assume that all man-made structures work perfectly all the time and we believe that the SCIS should explore the scenarios under which everything does not function perfectly. DNR's failure to provide adequate financial assurance is one scenario under which the polymath strategy to collect and treat water before it leaves the site could fail. How can the DNR in the EIS predict so confidently that it will be able to collect and treat water potentially for hundreds of years without showing that the funds are available to pay for it. It's a critical piece of environmental review. Now, you're hearing this argument from DNR that there's not enough information. It's too early, we, don't, we can't figure out how much financial assurance will cost. This simply isn't true. Polymath has piloted its water treatment technology with specificity. They can even tell you the cost per gallon to treat, get, to treat water. 
Polymet has designed and provided precise schematics for all of its barriers and collection systems. Those drawings are all available in the public documents, maybe not in the EIS, but in the underlying material. We have a lot of detail about Polymet's mine plan. And you might have picked up on some tension in Mr. Richard's uh, uh, um, testimony on this point. It seems that we have been in uh, environmental review for years, that we have a lot of information about the longevity of these structures, telling us speaking to the manufacturers, we have a lot of detail about what they're proposing, just not quite enough for financial assurance. Of course, it's true that the mine plan could change, but that's true of everything in the EIS, including all of the environmental impacts. That's not a reason not to make some calculations based on the information we have today. I'll tell you what, though. There's an easy way to test this argument. Simply require Polymet to show its work. It has projections. They're in the EIS. They're printed verbatim in the EIS for Polymet consultants. DNR has accepted these numbers. They have never asked Polymet to prove that these numbers are reasonable or based on acceptable assumptions. Ask the DNR to get these assumptions, these calculations from Polymet, which it should do anyway, because it published those numbers in the EIS. And then we can decide for ourselves whether polymer's calculations are premature or not. But they're out there, and we should be asking for them. Now, you'll be hearing later about how financial assurance has come a long way. Modern financial assurance packages are adequate. MCA does not disagree. It is theoretically possible and it probably has been done in some examples, although most of those mines are so new that that hasn't really been tested. But simply because it can be done does not mean that it will be done correctly in this case, and sunlight is the best to disinfectant. The sooner we know what DNR intends, the better the analysis will be. It belongs in the EIS. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you again. I have, uh, I have a question uh, about Well, there's, there's two um, structures on the site that are online, and in that case, it is not possible. One of them is the mine pit. Uh, the mine pit, a portion of it will be backfilled with all of the waste rock, um, some of it quite reactive, some of it less reactive. Um, and then there's a mine pit that will be an open lake. And those aren't lined. Um, they will be in contact with the superficial aquifer, they'll be in contact with the groundwater, and there's really nothing that uh, anybody can do to prevent that from happening. All that Polymet proposes to do is to pump water out of the west pit to try to prevent that lake from overflowing. But it doesn't do anything with the groundwater. Um, the second structure that has no lining is the tailings basin. Uh, the tailings basin, as we know, is a brownfield site that was previously owned by LTD. It predates the Clean Water Act. It predates modern environmental laws. It leaks about 2,000 gallons per minute. Now, Polymet is proposing to build a barrier down to the bedrock around that tailings basin uh, to collect the surface seepage, which is some portion of that 2,000 gallons per minute. But some portion of it is going into the bedrock, and it's going through uh, fractures in the bedrock. Uh, that, though, that leakage cannot be uh, collected. Um, I want to make one comment about the barrier around the tailings basin as well. Um, that structure needs to be keyed into the bedrock, meaning that polymet needs to actually dig into the bedrock. Otherwise, all you're going to get is water sliding under that barrier, out between the bedrock and the barrier. It's not going to work. Um, and that's actually not clear that they're proposing that from the uh, schematics that we've seen so far. So that's a detail that um, we probably need to know more about. In both of the pits that are online, they just have linings around the sides. Um, is there any, just in terms of, we're looking at financial assurance here, we're looking at, we have to pay to clean up what's going through. Um, is there any measure or standard of how much is okay to go through the ground, down now? Madam Chair, um, 
it's entirely dependent on the site itself. Um, there's a couple sets of laws that issue here. One would be the groundwater quality standards, um, which would apply uh, directly to whatever seeps out of these, uh, the mine pit and the tailings basin. Um, we also have surface water standards. Uh, there, or there's a, the Partridge River wraps around the mine site. It's quite close to the mine. Uh, the Barris River is fairly close to the Tailings Basin um, and is already affected by the Tailings Basin as it exists today. Um, and those, the way that the Clean Water Act is written is that discharges from the mine site and the Tailings Basin cannot cause or contribute to exceedances of the uh, surface water standards. Exceedances is a funny word. People hear that and they think we mean that the water is better than it should be, but exceedance is actually a legal term for violation. So it cannot cause or contribute to a violation. Uh, so in this case, the question is how much water is seeping out of the mine pit and the tailings basin, and is it enough and is it carry sufficient pollutants to cause violations of Clean Water Act standards in these nearby rivers? Um, you know, Polymet contends no, it does not. But again, they're assuming that all of their structures uh, work perfectly. So our concern is the scenario under which some of these structures do not, uh, are not, do not perform as well as proposed. Um, and in that scenario, you may see uh, water quality standard violations in the nearby rivers uh, much sooner um, and in, at higher levels than common experience. So that is where we have to estimate a what really is should be in a contingency fund, how much, and that's the kind of the missing piece as I see this at this point. We have the reclamation piece, we have if something in the permit is violated piece, but we do not have this piece. Am I reading that right? Madam Chair, that's correct. <laughs> Um, the EIS does not explore the scenario under which uh, these collection systems don't function as well as predicted. Um, and DNR has been quite clear at this point that that scenario also will not be included in financial assurance. So if we do have a wastewater treatment plant breakdown, um, one of the pipeline breaks, uh, the tailings basin <coughs> dam failures, which is the number one cause of mining pollution worldwide, um, any of these things happen, that's there will not be funds for that in the financial terms package. Um, but if, Madam Chair and committee members, look no further than West Virginia, where recently we saw a tank with uh, extremely tox toxic chemicals right next to a water body first. And the very next day, that company declared bankruptcy. They didn't wait to find out how much the liability would be. They didn't wait for the lawsuits. They declared bankruptcy and they walked away. So. Um, you know, we believe that it is naive to assume that the only potential costs that the state could be on the hook for are the costs of reclamation and closure. Accidents can also cause sudden problems that, that may cause a site to close down or a company to walk away. Well, if something is going through the bottom, it's not a <coughs> site. It's just that's, so it does seem to me that that is a piece of the puzzle that is missing here. It's no accident. We've, we've designed it without a miner, and that's how it seems to have designed both of these pits without miners. And we acquired miners for uh, landfills, new ones, old ones didn't have them. We learned better with part of the new ones. When we redid the Washington County landfill, we acquired a triple one. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this uh, very important topic. Uh, my name is Scott Strand, S-T-R-A-N-D. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. MCA is a public interest organization that uses law and science 
to protect Minnesota's environment, and we have been involved in the non-ferrous mining topic uh, for literally decades. Um, financial assurance is a critical issue. I commend the committee for taking it on. I think this is a perfect subject for rather tough legislative oversight because the, the, the costs of making the state are high. So I, again, I commend the committee for taking this issue on. I just want to finish off our testimony by articulating what I consider to be five key principles for doing the financial assurance work at the DNR. Um, five principles, and I think that will help um, you know, move this to a situation where we can uh, we can resolve a number of these issues. Um, number one's already been discussed. Uh, address financial assurance in the environmental review process in the EIS. If the agencies know enough about the wastewater treatment plants, the hydraulic barriers, the groundwater pumps, all of those man-made structures, um, they know enough about those things to tell us that water quality is going to be protected, then they know enough about them, or ought to know enough about them, to estimate the cost, how much money has to be set aside to maintain it. Principle number two, use objective outside indexes to set the key figures needed to, cal to calculate financial assurance. Discount rates, expected rates of investment return, inflation adjustments, equipment and labor costs. These are all should be determined by, by looking at outside indicators, objective indicators that are out there. These should not be the topic of negotiations. <coughs> Principle number three, respect Murphy's Law. Um, include the cost of remediating reasonably, po reasonably possible accidents or contingencies, <coughs> and do it up front. It's very hard to buy homeowner's insurance when your house is burning down. When an accident occurs, is not the time to seek additional financial assurance. What needs to be done is to give a reasonable estimate of the probability of these accidents occurring and make the appropriate assessment so that the financial assurance covers it, just like any insurer would do. Number four, don't rely on third-party guarantees. Um, Mr. Tomitz explained that the, the market for things like that is credit, surety bonds, insurance policy to cover this kind of liability is extremely limited now. Trust fund is probably the way that we're going to have to go. Um, but I think there's another element, and that's the legal element. Um, Third-party guarantees typically are not free from the reach of the bankruptcy court. More and more bankruptcy courts are using their broad injunction authority to take payments from non-debtors, in other words, guarantees from insurance companies, from banks, and from other sureties. They pay their money into the, into the bankruptcy estate and then they get a release from all liability from the bankruptcy court. Um, that's ex then that money that goes into that bankruptcy estate gets distributed according to the rules of the bankruptcy court. It's not available to somebody like the state of Minnesota anymore. That's happening more and more in the bankruptcy courts. It's a real risk. I'm not saying they can't be used to supplement, say, a trust fund arrangement. I think it's a sound idea. But we can't rely on those third-party guarantees in order to meet the requirements of the rules. And then finally, number five, um, and I think this is really the overarching principle, the risk of uncertainty, the risk of uncertainty has to be placed on the company, not on the taxpayer. Um, all of the testimony today has, should have made it quite clear that there's a lot that we don't know. Um, that's going to continue. There are going to be a lot of things that we're not going to know. But it is not fair to the taxpayers or the environment for them to take on the risk of getting it wrong. The risk of getting it wrong has to be on the company, and that should be a principle that, that informs all of the DNR's calculations in this area. Those are the five principles. Uh, there is no such thing as a risk-free mind, we all know that, but the DNR follows some of these principles of Minnesota's taxpayers and our environment have a better chance of being fairly protected. Thank you. Stand for your questions. Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Rebecca Rahm. I'm from Ely, Minnesota, and I represent both 
Northeastern Minnesota's for Wilderness and Organization of Residents and Business Owners and the Boundary Waters Watershed Coalition. The coalition is a national organization of groups that seeks to prohibit sulfide ore mining on the watershed of the Boundary Waters canoe area wilderness. Sulfide ore mining for copper, nickel, and other metals is a poisonous, destructive enterprise. The EPA says that the most toxic industry in the United States is hard rock mining, which includes the kind of sulfide ore mining proposed in northern Minnesota. Such mining has never been done without water pollution by acid mine drainage and heavy metals and without landscape destruction. Minnesota's financial assurance laws are not adequate to protect taxpayers, our water, our land, and our economy from the ravages of sulfide ore mining. In our judgment, no practical possibility exists that the laws can be amended to provide adequate financial assurance because as the recently released SDEIS for Polymet shows, the cost to be protected against will continue for centuries and are ultimately unknowable. Reliance on financial assurance to allow centuries of de degradation and pollution means that sulfide or mining companies will be allowed to destroy part of the earth and our water if they post a financial instrument. The earth and its resources, especially clean water, are finite. Monetizing their destruction is unsustainable and foolish. You can't drink money or catch fish in it. The cost to, to, to treat toxic water pollution and restore the landscape for hundreds of years is impossible to calculate and is therefore unknowable. The Polymet Plan acknowledges that toxic water pollution by acid, heavy metals, and sulfates from the mine site tailings and waste piles will require treatment for a very long time. Mechanical water treatment is part of the model proposed action for 200 years at the mine site and 500 years at the plant site. Twin metals and other mines proposed within the watershed of the boundary waters will undoubtedly be at least as bad. Because the massive cost of engineering, designing, planning, building, and maintaining water treatment for centuries is unknowable, adequate financial assurance is a pipe dream, no matter how the laws might be amended. It is irrational to believe that any water treatment facilities or regime or corporation will last for hundreds of years that any financial institution or instrument can provide a credible guarantee for hundreds of years, that there'll be no catastrophic failure by humans or equipment over hundreds of years, and that no cataclysmic natural event will occur over hundreds of years. Relevant to the discussion of financial assurance are the proposed mines north of the Laurentian Divide. Twin metals and other proposed sulfide ore mines will destroy large areas of the Superior National Forest and pollute the boundary waters to the area of wilderness. This ecological damage will devastate the stable and sustainable economy of the Ely community and neighboring areas. The unbroken history of mining areas in the U.S., including our own Iron Range, shows that mining displaces sustainable businesses and stable jobs that are the real key to prosperity. Sulfide ore mining is by its very nature destructive and time limited. It is subject to boom and bust cycles we cannot control or influence. The strength of northeastern Minnesota is clean air, clean water, and a healthy forested landscape. The Superior National Forest generates $500 million per year of economic activity, $100 million of which is attributed to the boundary waters. Immediately adjacent to proposed mine sites are 26 resorts, camps, and campgrounds. Immediately downstream of proposed mine sites and in the path of pollution are private lakeshore properties valued at $318 million. Just beyond these properties and in the direct path of pollution lie renowned Basswood Lake in the heart of the Boundary Waters. If Twin Metals and other sulfide mining companies were allowed to buy the right to destroy land and water by posting some kind of financial assurance, Ely's, now described as the gateway to the wilderness, would be surrounded by a massive industrial mining district. The most heavily built visited wilderness area in the United States and our only Lakeland wilderness would be a pollution dumping ground for multinationals and the base of Ely's economy would be lost. Financial assurance provi laws provide nothing to protect the county ta the tax base or the boundary waters, the private property owners, and the businesses that will suffer severe environmental and economic damage by the proximity of sulfide ore mines, centuries of toxic water pollution, and the destruction of the landscape. Modern mining companies are structured to limit liability. As a standard procedure for mining operations, Polymet is a shell company with limited assets. The objective is to shield its major investor, Glencore. Polymet has never operated a mine, but its major investor, investor Glencore, has a track record of labor and environmental violations associated with mining operations and corruption. 
Calling its North Net op mining operations are projected to last for 20 years, after which no further revenue will be generated from the mine. The only asset likely to be owned by Polymet at the time of mining shutdown will be the contaminated and toxic mine site and processing facility. Should non-compliance of mine permits and violations of laws commence after the mine ceases to operate, a likely and foreseeable event, a demand from the state for financial assurance would be fruitless. We recommend that Minnesota's financial assurance regulations be amended to expressly prohibit use of financial assurance to allow environmental damage and pollution that is projected to be long-term, meaning that treatment will be required beyond the closure of active mining operations. Mining activities that significantly damage the landscape for long-term and generate toxic water pollution requiring treatment for centuries should be deemed to be perpetual and therefore not allowable under Minnesota Rule 6132.200, which prohibits perpetual treatment. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thanks, Madam Chair. Just a quick question. Ma'am, did I hear you correctly when you said that mining is bad for the economy of northeastern Minnesota? Yes. Um, we've done a lot of uh, review of the economy of Ely and compared it to the economy of the mining communities in northeastern Minnesota. So, for example, we looked for a, a mining community that had a population the size of Ely. And you have to understand that for the north of the Laurentian Divide, it's Ely that would be impacted. Uh, Edwin is the size of Ely, has Thunderbird Mine within the boundaries of the city of Edwin. The last year, the state of Minnesota reported gross revenues, uh, gross sales revenues, Edwin was $41 million a year. Ely's is $106 million a year. Edwin relies on mining. Ely hasn't had a mine since 1967. Ely's economy, which is based fundamentally on the wilderness and a healthy national forest, would be displaced and replaced with what Edwin has. Yes, it would be bad for our economy. I don't see there's some questions. Thank you. Steve, too. Hi, someone. Hi, someone. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Steve Timmer. I live in Medina, Minnesota. I've been a practicing lawyer, business lawyer, and litigator for 49 years. I'm scarcely doing that myself. Uh, but I'm not here representing the federal board. Uh, just to make some observations about the national uh, insurance uh, process. I submitted a Testimony, but it's much about the liver, so these are the high points of all. In one of the lines you often hear in the summation in a wrongful death case is, you know, there's no amount of money that can bring old what's his name back. And you know, it's true. And if a polymate copper sulfide mine is visited by the back of black swan, an intensely negative, unanticipated event, uh, or even more ordinarily expected, Old oh, what's his name could be clean water in the embarrassing part of the river shirts for centuries, or close enough to forever. Uh, recent events involving the failure of a coal ash impoundment in North Carolina, or the major spill by a major company in West Virginia, all inform our thinking about these things. We must realize that if we ever have to look up what our financial assurances are, uh, the whole enterprise has already become a problem. It's a failure. It's a failure of the mind to do something it's supposed to. And it's a failure of the regulators to size the mine up and regulate it properly. For reasons set forth in my written submission, we can't rely on the promises of a never, never a mine, never a miner polymer to uh, provide anything in the truth. And according to the DNR, we can't, even though I believe it's permitted by statute, we can't rely on Polymet and its principal shareholder, Glenn Moore, the scribe, to provide guarantee to you. I think that's something that, that really ought to be foundational to any permit for mine. Make the people who are really standard benefit from it uh, come to the plate 
We can't rely on sureties either. Because as we found out recently, sureties like AIG uh, go bankrupt themselves. And then on top of that, they'll quit providing their undertakings if they're not paid for the other. And if Polygon runs into financial trouble, they'll quit paying the, the uh, quit paying, paying the sureties the premiums on, 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 on guaranteed that you send out. And if Polygon gets paid, who will pay them? And we'll pay them for 500 years after the money closes and there's no more money. The only thing we can really rely on is cash and cash equivalents, and lots of it. The cash, we need cash to run the pumps and replace the nuclear unit. Cash to replace uh, and main, to maintain and to replace the necessary potatoes. Uh, because they do fail. And one of the previous experts said that the potatoes down failures are one of the uh, principal expenses in, in uh, hazardous waste uh, or, or environmental cleanup. And we also need the cash to clean up the water that will be polluted in ways that we can't even imagine, but we know what happened, given the uncertainty involved in the entire world. Sulfide mining would be something extremely different from our soul. It would take us into the haunted houses of the Berkeley Pit, Barrack Hill, which was a potential gold mine in, in South Carolina that went from first shovel in the ground to Superfund site in 18 years. It was a really fast work. Uh, the summit of a uh, mine in Colorado, which is mentioned earlier, and Shabangalan, a uh, nickel mine in, in northwest Ontario, uh, which has uh, nickel pollution in, in, the, in the soil surrounding the mine, ten times the amount of the background. background. Sulfide so mining, uh, again, according to previous testifiers, uh, there's a current liability of over $2 billion to Superfund. Uh, Superfund liabilities exist. And probably many, multiple times that orders of magnitude uh, once it's uh, funded the term. And this is just a cleanup question. This is one of the things that I, that I find uh, most troublesome. Financial assurance does not include the consequential damages of spells of pollution. It doesn't you know, take care of the riparian interests of wild rice harvesters, municipal water utilities, anybody who manages a clean, clean supply of water. But it's blocked in invertebrates, fish, wildlife, aquatic plants, recreational users, and just human beings. So it's just part of part of the whole process. If you have any, thank you for letting me testify. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Frank Endar, I'm the Executive Director of Mining Minnesota for the Industrial Trade Association, representing the non ferrous mining industry in the state of Minnesota. Uh, as I looked at your agenda today, Madam Chair, uh, it lists this hearing will be limited to questions of how best to structure financial assurance. From the industry's perspective, financial assurance is already structured, and structured appropriately. Minnesota has thorough comprehensive financial assurance system already in place. It is amongst the strongest, if not the strongest, in the entire nation. Uh, an early indication of just how thorough it is comes simply from the narrative, from your house research, in the preamble to the questions that you have in front of you today. A comprehensive list of detailing various items required for financial assurance. A stronger indication is the 37 some pages of financial assurance requirements, both descriptive and prescriptive, in the financial assurance rules in Minnesota Rules Chapter 6132. These are rules promulgated in the 1990s with the years of study leading up to them, with input from all stakeholders, including environmental groups, 
and these financial assurance requirements for non-ferrous mining in the state of Minnesota solidly protect our Minnesota taxpayers. They protect our Minnesota taxpayers by requiring mining companies to have bankruptcy proof financial assurance in place to cover all costs of environmental cleanup before an issue is permitted, or before, uh, before issuing a permit. They protect the taxpayers by requiring a detailed review of all costs of potential environmental exposure annually and adjust that exposure annually and adjust the financial requirements annually and accordingly. The state protects the taxpayers by having the authority to deny or revoke a permit if a company does not comply. And the state protects the taxpayer by having those funds be available to the state at all times. The state protects the taxpayers by looking at the funding sources and having a variety of sources and allowing the state to determine the best funding source to have, all while making sure that it remains bankruptcy proof, continuously in place and available at all times. The state protects the taxpayers by very thoroughly listing what will need to be reclaimed from open pits to tailing bases to waste rocks to wetlands, restoration to building and infrastructure, and the list goes on. The state protects the taxpayers and financial assurance by requiring the period of time the financial assurance has to be covered, long enough to cover all reclamation or corrective action, long enough so that all conditions necessitating, necessitating post-closure no longer exist. In other words, no company will be released from its liability until all those post-closure uh, conditions no longer exist. And, like the very open and transparent public input opportunities for environmental review, there is an open public input opportunity for the permit to mine, application, and financial review. It's published in the EQB. It has to be published in a notice four consecutive weeks, and after that, the public has an opportunity to review and comment for 30 days after the last public notice. And we just heard from the DNR that they're going to add additional public input opportunities, which the industry thinks is a great idea, by having additional meetings and posting a permit to mine for any project, whether it's polymet or anyone to come in the future, uh, make it available electronically for folks to look at ahead of time. And again, the state protects the taxpayer by having the authority to deny, suspend, revoke, or modify a permit and issue civil penalties if necessary. As taxpayers, we should all be glad Minnesota will not only be protected, but that we will benefit from polymet or any other non-ferrous mineral project that comes forward and proceeds tax, occupation taxes, royalty taxes, income taxes, and for future projects billions of dollars to the Permanent School Trust Fund. Finally, financial assurance appropriately takes place in the permit to mine section. It is a function of permit enforcement, not environmental review. That's where a company, all companies, will have to show their work. Minnesota has a comprehensive, solid system in place, and no changes are needed to a Minnesota financial assurance law. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Enviro, I think you were in the room when I asked uh, Director Richards about another form of assurance, perhaps you know, physical or the asset of the, of the actual ore. Um, and I don't know if you, you covered that earlier in your presentation or not, but the response from uh, Director Richards was to have uh, a potential that could have some interest as a potential addition or as another uh, tool uh, to provide uh, assurance on top of. So I, I'd like your, you know, Representative Gill had provided some uh, example of precedent um, and I had somebody contact me that said I think Alaska uh, provides some assurance that requires uh, retention of gold. Your response Madam Chair, Representative Hansen, uh, from an industry perspective, all states are unique. 
whole project in all states are unique. In Minnesota, we have a variety of ownership uh, scenarios. We have private surface, we have state surface, we have federal surface, we have private minerals, we have state minerals, we have federal minerals, and all of those will play significant uh, factors in any discussion uh, along the lines of a question like that. And that would be something the DNR would have to uh, uh, work with uh, with the state, with the federal regulators, uh, if their federal ownership, and with the company as they look at what structure would best fit any particular unique mining situation in the state. Madam Chair, Mr. It seems like these metals, um, the precious metals, are uh, rarer and rarer. Lots of them are very, very rare. Uh, and throughout the world, we have a uh, chase going on with the precious metals as well as greater attempts to recycle some of the uh, copper and other, other metals. So, with the the market after everybody in this room has been and gone, um, the metals will still be there if they're not mined or if we retain them, they could potentially still be there for future generations um, as some type of assurance after the promises that we've all made or the contracts that we've set uh, after we're gone. Um, and that's why I think there's some attractiveness to that. Because there's only a limited amount of these metals and they're harder and harder to get. Uh, and I think that's some context I see. It's not as easy to just go find pure copper uh, near the surface as it might have been here in the years ago and certainly not as around the so It's not as easy to go mine for gold uh, in California than in the years ago. It's harder, costs more, the companies are more willing to do it because there's just not that much. Um, so it's likely that these metal values are going to go up over time, and that is just a, a general state interest. Okay. Madam Chair, Representative Hansen, if, if your question specifically, will, will metals fluctuate in price over time? Um, and certainly uh, one would hope from an uh, uh, investment standpoint that metals would increase uh, over a period of time. And, uh, their value would increase. Certainly in the state of Minnesota, from a resource standpoint, uh, we have identified uh, already in Minnesota uh, one of the largest uh, base and precious metal uh, deposits uh, in the world. And every time a company does further exploration, uh, that resource estimate number continues to grow. Our, our resource in Minnesota is tremendous. And, Madam Chair, uh, sufficient to last most likely a hundred years or longer. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Thank you, members of the committee, for inviting me here today to testify about this important topic of financial assurance of the Polymer Mine Project. My name is Ron Sparrow. I'm a recently retired Wall Street executive, and um, I, I can, I'm reminded, as we all are, by the recent environmental disasters in South and West Virginia and the coal ash spill in the Dan River in North Carolina, that these accidents, or as they're known in my world, unanticipated liabilities, do happen, and that financial assurance of a risky environmental project like the polymath mine is important. Permit me to emphasize the word risky. I was motivated to testify today on financial assurances for the polymath project after listening to proponents of this project characterize it as if it were a can't-miss investment opportunities. No downside, I heard. Mining and clean water code. Great opportunity for all of us in Minnesota, but better move fast this has been thoroughly vetted, and we're dealing with great people. This offers full employment for the range, school trust funds and tax coffers filled to overflowing. Mining and clean water too, no risk, permit now. Signed here and here, and I've been told uh, there are 21 permits involved, so I guess we need 21 signatures. 
And then away we go. In my 25 years on Wall Street, assisting some of the nation's largest pension funds and best, I had heard similar pitches many, many times and knew it was a signal to head for the exit or do more investment research. I applaud the committee for addressing the questions on financial assurance posted on your website, and I offer the following advice. First, remember that mining companies aren't angels sent from heaven. Their goal is to make as much money as possible for themselves and shareholders. They don't really care about us. To them, pollution is just another cost of doing business. If this project makes it to the financial assurance state, please drive a hard bargain. Whatever you amount to come up with, they'll scream it is too high, not reasonable, and they'll threaten to go back to Canada or Switzerland or Chile or wherever they may be from. When that happens, remind yourself the price of copper is easy to determine. This morning it was quoted at $3.22 a pound. More of it's coming on the market all the time. This year, in 2014, 7% of the miners around the world will mine 7% more than they did last year. But, while that's easy to value, how do you value something as rare as the Partridge or Embarrassed Rivers? And even think, then think about the $1 billion cleanup cost for the TBA ash spill of 2008 into the Emory River in eastern Tennessee and hold your ground. And, and, and by the way, if you do negotiate to agree to a, a, a reasonable, what everybody considers to be a reasonable financial assurance uh, contract, you probably said it too well. Uh, my second advice, get the financial assurance in cash. Don't take their IOU. Polymet is one of 2,000 junior miners listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange. These are startup businesses, and most of them will not make it. No bank would lend money to any of these miners, including Polymet. Polymet. But if they did, they would require a huge risk premium. The state should get a risk premium, too. As of the end of last October, Polymet had $41 million in the bank and was burning through it. They have no income from other sources. They have never permitted or developed a mine. They have no experience operating a mine. They have no experience with the pollution abatement technology proposed. They have no experience in mine reclamation. And this is a mine that will have AD, acid drainage. This project is a bad bet for the state of Minnesota, and the Polymet messes up their judgment proof. In other words, they have no deep pockets to go after. The taxpayers will be left holding the bag. A better bet would be to deal directly with Glencoe Strata, Polymet's primary owner, who will take over the project as soon as all permits are signed, according to Wall Street research firm Stiffel Nicholas. But don't expect Glencoe Estrada to stick around either. According to the London Financial Times, they are selling all their startup greenfield operations and focusing their investments on operating. This is tricky business. If the state of Minnesota doesn't want to be left holding the bag, they'll have to be very smart in how they structure this deal and how much they get in an ironclad financial assurance, i.e. cash. Which brings me to my third piece of advice. Hire sharks. If the permitting on this mine gets to the financial assurance stage, the state will be working with attorneys for the mining companies who do this all day long. The state better be sure they have counsel equally adroit or be prepared to be so sorely disappointed when something goes wrong and a loophole prevents paying up, necessitating a long and costly legal fight and ongoing polluting mess. Remember, mining companies are not angels. They're not here to help us. They will fight to keep every liability off their books and their cash in their account. Finally, the state of Minnesota needs to assess its political fortitude. Do our regulatory agencies have the guts to shut down a polluting mine and put people out of work? In my research, I have not found a single instance in the U.S. of a mine being shut down by the regulatory agencies empowered to protect us. Mines are allowed to continue to pollute as the regulatory agencies take years issuing verbal notification, inspection reports, letters of warning, notices of violation, field citations, schedules of compliance, administrative orders, etc., etc., etc. All the while, pollution continues. The state's greatest leverage is now during the permitting process. Once a mine is operational, the leverage moves to the mining company. I have a counter proposal. If the state believes taking on all the environmental and financial risk associated with this mine is worth the $15 million a year and increased projected tax revenues, as stated in Polymet's latest sales presentation, 
Why not simply sell the water the state is willing to pollute to the North Dakota frack oil drill? <laughs> water is in high demand in North Dakota, and, and higher yet further west. Our water is valuable and renewable. If we are really willing to pollute our cleanest asset, perhaps we should consider selling our water, not our copper. Thank you for hearing me today. Thank you, and thank you for giving us the praise on anticipated liabilities. That is uh, something I wanted to hear more about from DNR, and I hope that they will give us a really good list. Thank you, Madam Chair, and Mr. Sterl, thank you for your time. And, uh, I'm just a simple farmer from Western Minnesota, and, and trying to understand a few of these things, and uh, I guess I look at this as you said that a bank wouldn't lend these entities money, and so they're going out for some other type of financing. And I, I look, you know, at the state of Minnesota, we're asked to get a permit potentially to do business, and so we're we're in one sense doing business with these folks. Should we, as a state, have access? to the books to see what we're dealing with. And I know that's one thing that the entity's been hesitant about, saying that they, they can't provide real open and transparent books to us to, to really understand what the finances are because there might be trade secrets or other things. And so I just want to get your perspective. This is, I mean, how much should we know? Madam Chair, uh, Representatives, I cannot speak for Polymet and um, if it were me, doing business for them. If I were the state, for instance, I would ask for everything and uh, I would get it before I did any business for them. You have them, uh, right, as I mentioned, you have the leverage now. If you say it's a, it's a condition and you have to have it, are there, then I, I will say you will probably get it. Thank you. And if I could ask, I, I was going to ask about water because I asked that earlier, but you brought up that perhaps selling to the, uh, the shale boom industry in North Dakota would be more financially prudent for our state, but how do we value water? I mean, and should we be valuing water? Because oftentimes we put such a low value on it that it, it seems like it's almost valued us in one sense. Madam Chair, Representative, that's a great question. I uh, recently was in California, uh, just before uh, a, two, a week and a half ago, and was talking to a person out there. Uh, about our mining and about their water shortage, and he mentioned that his water bill for the well, most recent month was $300 for water, and he's just a regular guy. Now, the I asked if I could, I did a little research on the uh, cost of water to residents of California. Maybe that's a good place to start. Water is appreciating in value, uh, and uh, believe me, it's, it's in high demand and it has a value. And how we uh, we have the market hasn't done a good job yet in putting a price on oil. I know uh, that the uh, oil frackers in uh, North Dakota are buying water. I don't know what they're paying for. And I'll tell you uh, the one other thing I can tell you is that while I was in California, uh, I learned that uh, the uh, fracking industry has a great opportunity in uh, California. There's a lot of oil shale, and there are, there's many opportunities for them to. Uh, access this, but it would require water for them to do that. And they have made the decision in California not to allow uh, oil shale development, not to, to allow fracking, because in their estimations, in their opinion, and their determination, the state of California doesn't need more energy, they need water. That tells you that to them, water is more valuable there than oil. That's a start. Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, what I did was get on the uh, municipal websites for the uh, cities around San Francisco where I was visiting and uh, uh, just investigated their uh, water rates to their residents. And uh, so I could be, I'd be happy to put you, uh, get those links to, um, to Mike. Well, I was uh, thinking about their decisions of what to do Decision not to do something like that. 
because the water is too precious. Is that documented someplace where we can get that? It was uh, reported in the uh, press in so many words. I'm paraphrasing their decisions out there. That would be good. I'd be happy to research that for you. Thank you for asking. Thank you, Madam Chair. And at the same time, could you also uh, research, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Stengel? Start off. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, how many billions of gallons of water a day in California just disappear into the ocean? Because they're not creating reservoirs and some of the critical infrastructure that they need. Um, is, that, is that also a part of their water shortage issue? The water shortage issue, yes, does... Um, uh, does that does come up in a discussion and uh, to that point there is so little water going into um, the uh, ocean at this point that the salmon runs uh, cannot make it upstream and they're expected to uh, perish and become extinct so there's not that much water going into the uh, uh, the Atlantic o to this, the Pacific Ocean in the uh, Bay Area uh, in the northern part of California right now does, does that help you? Yeah, I'm just looking for some, some hard numbers on that. Um, Madam Chair, Representative, that I'm not sure I could uh, uh, help you with, uh, but I'd certainly be willing to look into it for you. Okay. Thank you so much. Mike, you can come back in a few minutes. We're upstairs. Hang with us. Just for a minute, guys.